ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, those beyond and in between the binary, this podcast episode is scheduled for one hour, and is the next episode of Glow the Distance, a gorgeous ladies of wrestling podcast! Coming to the mixer first, hailing from Oakland, California. She has a BA in sapphic design and has more dick jokes than the H in PhD. Jenna Ray! And her co-host, also hailing from Oakland, California. Her friends call her Holden Cauldron Field. They threw the book at her and she dog-eared the pages. Lauren Parker! Well, let me tell you something. Lauren, I'm glad to be here this week. I'm glad to be here with you. Uh, It's been a hell of a week. Uh, I no longer have homophobic bourbon. That's excellent. exciting. Excellent. Uh, granted, at the super overpriced uh, grocery store, it is still ten dollar bourbon. <laughs> <laughs> and I hear uh, the tinkling of, of, a, of a beautiful laugh. We have a guest. We do. Yeah. We do. Where? Um, yeah. So our guest. We have a guest this week. So we're covering. Ep- so this is episode ten. Right. We're covering episode seven of Glow, the actual show. Uh, and we have a guest today. We have uh, Lux Lives. Um, she's a uh, model, performer, <coughs> great kisser. Porn star. <laughs> I love all of these words. You know, yeah, they all kind of apply to me. Yes, I never, I kind of shuffle between them. So, yeah. <laughs> so, um, so, so Lux and I actually, like, e-met while watching Wrestle Kingdom. Um <laughs> Yeah, it was wrestling, Wrestle Kingdom. So Wrestle Kingdom, also known as like the Dome Show, is like the big. It's at the beginning of January, but it's like the big end of the year. Oh, so like, does wrestling have seasons like sports? Not re- well, so typically what wrestling, what, what big companies like WWE and New Japan have is they'll have one big super show, mm-hmm. and then all like that's kind of the year cycle. But it's kind of like taxes. Like they don't run like on a. <laughs> It's not a January to December. So, so like, so New Japan has the Tokyo Dome show. It's Wrestle Kingdom. That you know, that's usually the first week of of January, and then literally the next day, New Begin is a show called New Beginning, and that's where they set up all the new storylines that sure. are going to go forward. Um, WrestleMania season starts in January with the Royal Rumble, and then goes to WrestleMania, which is typically in March or April. Okay. So, but I mean, WrestleMania season starts the raw after WrestleMania. So, <laughs> true. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'd say WWE is a little bit more self promotional, I guess, in the way that they organize their storylines. New Japan is a little bit more, like, there's, there's better. <laughs> I don't know why I watch that true. WWE trash. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, the way the, the the significance of the Royal Rumble. So the Royal Rumble is a show uh, in January, and it's called that because the main event is usually the Royal Rumble, which is a, a thirty-person like battle royal, mm-hmm. and then whoever wins that gets to face the world champion at WrestleMania. Gotcha. But usually by then, everyone knows who's going to win it anyway. Okay. Um, Much like the World Series. <laughs> oh, sorry. Did I say that into a recording device? <laughs> So, uh, so we're we're watching episode seven, live studio audience. Mm-hmm. It was di- it's directed by Jesse Peretz, who directed the pilot. Um, he also oh, okay. did some episodes of Girls and also directed Our Idiot Brother. Uh, these neither one of these are shows I've seen. I, I kind of uh, tend to avoid anything that Lena Dunham has done because I didn't like her book and I saw her movie and I felt like I was good. <laughs> like I'm like okay like I'm done now and then she apparently does stuff on Twitter that I wouldn't like so I just am kind of like I, I, have, I have no horse in the race but I am not invested in girls <laughs> yeah Lena, Lena Dunham's career aged like a like a tomato on the counter basically. it aged like 30 rock yeah <laughs> <laughs> it aged like 30 rock it aged it's... like many white feminists in the entertainment industry it seems Boom! <laughs> Just a lot of them. I liked them in like in 2008. Everything was so nice, and now now look at us. Now I don't like Tina Fey. I don't like Amy Poehler. Look, and none of them like wow. 
I thought yeah. you were funny once, but I guess I was wrong. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm not caught up in like anything that like. So Amy Poehler has done things that I've liked and has sort of been more baseline palatable than I think the rest. She is the most like palatable, but like having gone back and watched Parks and Rec, now that I'm like a sex worker, it's like it's riddled. Oh with horror yeah, horror. no, they're riddled, no. and it's like something I never picked up on before. So it's just like kind of interesting how you get more. Uh, attuned to those things but then i've come back and watched it and be like oh man like, <laughs> yeah totally it, typical like exactly. asexual neutered second wave white feminism bullshit like over it over it <laughs> i was just talking about this horrible shit to jenna <laughs> earlier <laughs> about how i'm like you know what no i've done it i've read all the andrea dork and i care to and i'm done with this now and i get to be the second wave is canceled yes it's canceled it's it's like cheers it ran for a long time we see its value. It's it's the Archie Bunker of feminism. It, it, like, you know, it laid down the framework, but, like, ugh, I just stopped beating it over my head. <laughs> you know what? Very problematic, you know, Origins gave us aqueducts. Like, it, it's, it, it, like, we can take the good and leave the bad. <laughs> uh, the episode was written by Rachel Schukert. Mm. Um, we've talked about her. She wrote Debbie Does Something. yes. I, we really liked that episode. That was the episode where it kind of turned it around. Yeah, for you. yeah. Um, so and this is also a really good episode. Yeah, I, I think that there's this glow is sort of two series in one, and that like the first half is definitely written for people that don't know anything about wrestling, and so the first half is why you should care about wrestling. <laughs> then the back half is for wrestling fans, where it's like, see now you care about wrestling. And well, that's why kind of wrestling it, is so great and get all like misty and just like <laughs> yes. exactly. So I, I kind of at this point I'm like I don't know like I think wrestling fans should probably skip the first three episodes and then just sort of jump in in like four or five um, because I think that that's that's kind of when it heats up for people that really really care about the form um, and that's that's what I recommend as somebody who is a wrestling widow. <laughs> this is a, a bad guest to bring on then because that was me and Lex's first date was really? was watching wrestling together. Oh. Yeah. On Skype. I mean, I'm yeah. not, I'm not on like I get it. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> I'm I'm the lonely. I don't get this in the sea of like fans. That's what's important. You're educating me. You're sharing your culture with me. <laughs> You're like the ethnographer, you know. You're just observing. <laughs> I yeah. I'm the Jane Goodall of wrestling. Yes. Like I don't understand all of it, but I'm immersed. And yeah, you know, <laughs> welcome. <laughs> We embrace all. Thank you. It's been very lovely. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So we'll jump into the fan news minute. Yep. Um, Let's put 60 seconds on the clock. I will take a sip of my ancient age and Coke zero while it's still on the show. Oh, so like on that little, uh, on that little sheet you sent me, you making tricking sounds, that was literal, is it? <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was like trying to figure that out. All right. Nice. I love it. <laughs> And there it is. All right. So, so I guess for me, the biggest wrestling news to come up is um, uh, there's a wrestler named Sexy Star who legitimately injured her opponent on purpose oh, at wow. a recent show, at a triple A. So, she, so tri Sexy Star is a luchadora. So is Rosemary. They were wrestling at Triple Mania, which is uh, Triple A's big annual show which um, is unfortunately on the same day as the uh mcgregor mayweather fight this year so oh yeah yeah Ooh. i didn't see a thing about it on you know twitter really um uh. so yeah it's like this is a huge piece of news that got totally buried yeah um and yeah she legitimately on purpose like wrenched like put rosemary in an arm bar like in a in a shoot way that caused her legitimate injury and it could be a career ending injury wow um what a dick it fucked up um the silver lining is that it has gotten a bunch of wrestlers to talk about consent <laughs> like well, that's cool. yeah. <laughs> okay Espe specifically joey ryan mr i hit people with my dick for yeah. money yeah the one that wrestles women yeah mm. he's actually on the 9th uh of september he's wrestling in a there's a wrestle circus is doing a texas versus the world wrestling show to raise money for uh survivors of the hurricane oh okay and he's wrestling he's he's wrestling delilah doom and one other woman in a triple threat you want to know the worst part of this what is the worst part of this is that you're telling me all this information and it's all valid and i'm going to tell you the only thing that i remember about joey ryan is that he i go, like i looked him up on wikipedia and i remember that he's a pisces and nothing else <laughs> <laughs> 
So I'm going to exit stage left pursued by a bear because <laughs> it's what I deserve. Lux, do you have any wrestling news? Oh, gosh. Well, there's that sexy star biz. Um, I guess like SummerSlam, there's news from SummerSlam. I guess I, I wouldn't call it news, I guess, that Lesnar won the belt because it was like utterly expected. But I would like to celebrate the fact that there was a championship match between two people of color, uh, one of whom does not like speak English super well, and the other one is just constantly saying that white people are terrible. And like they were in like one of the championship matches together at this like pay-per-view, and I'm just like, man, like it just like like maybe there's hope for this world, man. <laughs> I'm, Rock team, on. I'm I'm team ginger, and that was like I th- I think that is news that you know that that happened at SummerSlam and almost nothing else of note. All right, shall we jump into progressive caveats? I'll put 60 seconds on the clock. Some progressive caveats for your praxis. My 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 note here is just make a Tina Belcher noise. <laughs> mine is uh, mine is honestly drinking sounds. Uh, <laughs> Oh my god, there's so much. <laughs> okay. I could have gone longer. Content warning. Uh, <laughs> clan people appear in this one. Oh boy. I thought you were going to do a content warning for vocal fry. <laughs> <laughs> that too. <laughs> um, yes. Uh, I think, honestly, the thing that I want to, like, content warniest about the most is the line that, like, Mark Marin says where he, he basically, like, during the the the, the KKK spin-out fight calls people the blacks, which is, we, as we said in, in the episode prior, um, when you put an article in front of words like that, you become a... A not trustworthy person you know like a jew or the jews and uh th- this applies also to to other things <laughs> and uh <laughs> it wow <laughs> yeah it played i mean it's, stuff. <laughs> it's because i've we've seen the whole show now um because i was bad and i binged uh i'm so proud of you <laughs> thanks um it like Sam's relationship to his racism Ooh. is Ooh. yeah. Well, because it comes so it's he 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 is like Tinkerbell. He can only possess one thing at a time, from the book, not the movie. Um, so Tinkerbell is a tiny fairy, and because of that, she can only experience one emotion at a time. <laughs> so that's that's legit. That's the only thing that you should ever take from that book. And Sam <laughs> is also his capacity for empathy is very tiny. <laughs> So you can only do one at a time. So it's women or <laughs> like yeah. people of color or person of color or black singular person. <laughs> like he just can't. Yeah. Like... I was going to save this for like the for when we cover um, the finale. But like there is a dude like that. There is a Sam in every anti-racist like group. Yeah. Like whether it's a working, com- whether it's like a working group or He's generally like, Pat like, Oswald. <laughs> like, I mean, no, there's always like, there's always like, there's always okay. a white man who has like, has like his heart's in the right place, but he's just like such like he, he feels like his willingness to acknowledge racism gives him this room to be regressive in ironic ways. Yeah. Um, I think, I think it's sort of the benefit of the doubt is, is something that he should feels compe- like compelled to deserve. Like he feels entitled to. And I hate that guy yeah. in every meeting, but I'm also periodically grateful because he reminds me of what not to be yeah. <laughs> or what I could have been. Yeah. He's like a really good uh, benchmark for like yourself. And also, <laughs> honestly, I end up stuck with that guy in buses and then lifts a lot or like at family reunions a lot. <laughs> Did I tell you about the time I got I got out of a moving lift on Christmas Eve? No. So, well, it was technically Christmas Eve because it was like two or three in the morning. But mm. I babysat. Um, I used to babysit for a family that lived in the city, um, and they were having a date night like on the twenty third. Um, so I watched their their baby, 
Um, and then afterwards, they just called me a Lyft um, and had and just had the Lyft drive me from San Francisco to, to Oakland. And we were stuck on the bridge two in the morning because there was construction. Oh, so okay. we're stuck. And this guy is just going whole hog on this. This You know, after, like, this was way before. Like, this was, like, the December before the election. And oh, he was God. going whole hog on this, like, we need to not let any more of X people uh, immigrate until we figure out what their motivations are and what all ever. So I just got out. Um, on the bridge? Yeah. You can walk across it. There's no rule against it. They just really don't want you to do it. But is there like a sidewalk for you to do that? There is not. Cheddar Ray. <laughs> Next time, I'm going to need you to tell me to eat a burrito and come get you. God. Or call you another lift, for God's sake. Uh. Oh, that's a good Christmas Eve I will list. watch Sorry. all the Major League if it will keep you from doing that. Well, there are two more films. Actually, three. I think there's three more. Are you fucking with me? What? There's as many major league films as there are Lethal Weapons. Okay. All right. So there's yeah, there's the sequel where they actually where you find out they didn't win the World Series, but they're gonna try again. Um, and the coach like almost dies of a heart attack, so he has to like. What do we call that Graduate League? Yeah. So he's like in the, <laughs> he's, he's like in a hospital and listening to the game on the radio secretly because his doctor doesn't want him to listen to it because it'll give him a heart attack. And then like. There's a, yeah, then there's like a third one where they reunite the team in the minor leagues. Yeah, it's. I did not buy enough bourbon for this. <laughs> All right, so I guess we'll go into the recap then. Yeah. Sorry, Lux. Uh, and do you have, actually, do you have progressive caveats, things that really, really upset you? Because we haven't actually asked you anything yet. So, hey, shoot it your way. <laughs> <laughs> oh, don't worry. I was just like. I was just kicking back, you know. I was like, wow, I'm just listening to a really nice podcast right now. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> oh, no, no worry. I was, I, that was a really good, those was, was some good caveats there. Very solid caveats. <laughs> yeah. Oh, gosh. I mean, what isn't there? I almost just like don't even want to get started because like it's just everything is terrible and I hate it. And that's what I'm going to go with. <laughs> okay. Lux, sweetheart. Um, I, I know that this is asking a lot uh, emotional labor wise kind of early on in our relationship, but if you would just, do you feel comfortable talking about, you know, just like what it's like watching a show uh, that just like a wrestling show that just like has like sex worker jokes in it, like every episode. Yeah. Yeah. Like, well, honestly, it's not that different of an experience than me watching <laughs> anything on TV at all. Um, I kind of just point, tuned out yeah. at this point. Like it's like, I don't think there's any show that I can think of in memory that has not had frequent jokes about, like, you know, like, strippers, quote, hookers, like, you know, all this stuff like that. Like, I'm, I don't know why I'm rewatching Friends, but God help me, I'm rewatching no, Friends. No, what? <laughs> no! Like, AKA, God. like, white people living in unrealistic apartments. And, and I just, like, sit there and complain about it the whole time that I'm watching. But, like, uh... That show also, like, I going back now, I'm just like, oh my god, there's so many, like, jokes degrading sex workers in this show. And it's just, like, going back and, like, seeing, like, this is, like, it's not new, you know? And it's certainly not, like, intrinsic to Glow. So in that sense, it's, like, not really a different experience for me watching this than anything else on TV. Um, you know, it's just, like, every time it happens, you're just like, oh, hmm, I forgot. That That's you. how I feel watching everything and trans jokes. I'm like, yeah, oh, trans jokes now, are the same yeah. way. Now I get. Sure. Oh, I've, I've seen maybe two or three whole episodes, like episodes of Friends. Um, there's one episode where, like, so M Monica is dating Tom Selleck for some reason. Yes. Yeah, that was and, that's where and, I, I. Yeah, just, and Jennifer yeah. Aniston is dating. Uh, David Schwimmer, and so there's this scene where where Monica and Jennifer, Aniston, I don't even know all their fuck. Rachel, yeah, Rachel. So Rachel and Monica <laughs> haircut, haircut are is there. <laughs> are in the bathroom fighting over the last condom. Oh, so that they can have oh. sex. And I just remember watching that as can be like, are, do, is no one giving out handies like in New York at the remember, cusp of the millennium? It's like what is sex? Yeah, 
It's strange. Yeah, but it, I lost, mean, it lost on, me. On the one hand, it's like if somebody said, eh, it's cool, I'll figure it out, that would be considered anti-safe sex. It's so fucking bizarre in straight mm -hmm. land. Yeah. Oh, totally. Especially like at that time, like, you know, in the 90s and stuff like that, which they just never stop reminding you of with those pre-9-11 Weirdly, York skyline shots. Like, oh, it's just all the time between every scene. It's like, yep, okay, I get it. And coffee. <laughs> 1997. Like like, yeah, because in 97, coffee was constantly a metaphor for bar, but we couldn't call it that. Oh, yeah. And just like whenever um, they talk about computers, oh, it's so precious. Like, yeah. you know, just, yeah. But uh, yeah, it's just like, a, I think it kind of like harkens back to that culture, this like sort of like shallow, you know, very surface level safe sex culture, but not like actually telling people to do the really like important things with safe sex, like talking about consent. And talking about boundaries and stuff like that it's just like condoms it's the only thing you gotta know like you yeah know. there's so like, safe sex but it's not sex positive yeah totally so you're right it is like a, it's like totally like sexual illiteracy that is just you know such a thing in uh, such more of a thing in straight culture because people just like don't think about it you know because it's just like it's their sexuality is so normalized that like i guess they just don't like even think twice well <laughs> there's also like weird terminology and framework around it like it, it's too super normalized uh, or it, it, straightness is common it's not normal yeah exactly just like normalized like in our culture putting out like how we talk about it is super fucking weird like all of it's a strange context um, oh yeah. but i did see the one where she somebody was dating bruce willis I think it was Rachel was dating Bruce Willis. Yeah. Oh my God, and then, I don't even know they date everything. And then, okay, and then, <laughs> oh, yeah. And then there's one where, like, one of them's dating Jon Favreau, and he's an MMA fighter. But it was back when MMA had, like, no rules. Like, it was back before MMA had, like, had, like, the rules around, like, unprotected shots to the head. Because mm -hmm. you used to just be able to fucking beat, like, hit someone in the head with an elbow over and over and over. Yeah. All right, let's... Okay. okay. Actually, so Lux, as, as our guest, yes, there's a question that I ask every single guest yes. that comes on. Yes, yes. yes. <laughs> Lux, as our guest, there is a question that I ask every single guest that comes on. What is wrestling? Porn. <laughs> <laughs> Unpack that for me, would you? <laughs> well, I like. I firmly believe that wrestling and porn are like. Uh, virtually the same like there's like a very very minuscule difference but other than that it's like virtually the same in the sense that like you know it's like physical and like it's basically stunt work um but like weird stunt work and uh, <laughs> um it's like about like developing a character and a persona and trying to get that over with your fan base and if that doesn't work trying something else you know like i can listen to um like podcasts with wrestlers <laughs> and uh the things they say about the industry i'm like you could take out a couple of nouns and you could take this exact piece of advice and apply it to the like uh porn industry uh and just like when i watch it you know just like uh, just the dynamics that they set up between characters like it's it's even beyond like it's like obviously like they're like sweaty and they're just like kind of mashing their bodies together but it like goes beyond that you know um and yeah it's just like you know these like the storylines and like just the way the whole wrestling world works you know like the, the laws of the wrestling universe are very similar to the laws of porn universe like you know in wrestling like at the end of any conflict somebody's like they're gonna wrestle and in porn in porn at the end of every conflict somebody's gonna like masturbate you know but <laughs> always moving towards this goal <laughs> like that's our that's our next instagram meme is that quote i think so <laughs> I think Melrose would agree. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> All right. Shall we so, jump into the mm, uh, recap? Yeah, our lit recap. Yes. It's um, the littest. So uh, we get a cold open to start the show with, with the glow women, like, literally chasing cars in the street <laughs> to promote their upcoming free show. It's like that weird outtake from Dodgeball. It's a, it's a really strange little, uh, like, moment. Um, um that's like me promoting my porn though. It's, I did the exact thing. I'm just like clutching these like poorly made flyers and just stuffing them wherever I can find them and be like, go to this weird <laughs> website. Like <laughs> this show I relate to on a number of levels in that I'm like a really like lowly independent porn just putting out my smut, just trying to get someone to look at it. <laughs> That's all art, I believe. Yep, exactly. <laughs> her, her art's real good. I I believe it. Yeah, I know we you're will a be fan. We'll be endorsing her art in the show notes. 
Yay! Um, Give Lux money yes. and us money. <laughs> Everybody needs money. Guys. <laughs> um, Sheila is very excited because she has met Rob, oh. and Rob has promised to bring his whole coven to the show. How okay? How many? What is the requirement? Like, what is the minimum requirement? For like a cup, so like in in DSA, like a steering committee is five. Minimum is seven. Seven. Yeah. Customary thirteen. Oh, so is it all wow. okay? Does it have to be a prime number? Um, it has to be a magical number. You know, like so, I actually just watched this episode like an hour or two ago, and I remember <laughs> you they they uh, show some of the members of that coven in like the wrestling scene in the scene with the actual show and stuff like that. Such bored goths, I yeah. feel. Well, exactly. Like, they, you had anything better to do <laughs> at first, yes. But then, as they're like swept away by the magic of wrestling, like at first they give these like sort of like gothy golf claps, you know, like like it looks like they're, they're like, like stroking oh, some yes, kind let of the cat, vampires like, do their thing. Yes, but then like by the end they're like chanting like USA, you know, the goths too become rednecks in the end. Um, <laughs> but if memory serves, there were seven of them in the crowd. Yeah. So I think you might be right about that. Cust customarily an official coven is, is seven or um to thirteen. Um mm -hmm. it, it can get it can get bigger. I don't necessarily recommend that you do that. Um, but magical numbers are seven and thirteen. Mm. Um, I mean, you, you you could do a tight knit circle of three women, but like or three people, three magical practitioners it doesn't have to be women. Um, but that's sort of the the general rule. Uh, the thing that I like about Rob is that he seems very overwhelmed by Sheila. I like that Sheila has this impact across the board. Like she has she has no community. She is tr she is a typical lone wolf. <laughs> She's like, I'm excited about this for now. <laughs> I love um, and then our next, so so then we go, you know, big credits, you know, uh, big neon uh, splash, and then we're at the gym, um, and <clears throat> all the wrestlers are looking at their lineup for the upcoming Friday show. Um, we finally hear someone speak Welfare Queen's shoot name, yeah, um, but only because someone is correcting her. <laughs> Because she's like, oh, I made the list. And someone's like, everyone made the list because it's just the matches. Yeah. Um, she's excited because she's teamed up with Cherry against the biddies. And Cherry is not thrilled at all because she notices that there is a commonality. Okay. So, yes, 100%. Like, that's definitely, like, a motive that happened. And, and, and Cherry is upset about the, the her horrible-ass character that she was given, who is terrible. Um and her outfit is equally bad. Like, that is a gorgeous woman. You put her in a mustard, weird men's swimming outfit from 1898, really? But anyway. Um, but this is also, like, the first time that the two black women in this cast have ever talked to each other. <laughs> like, they never talk to each other. And and that is is irregular. Like that that almost seems a, a bit like a move by white writers, where it's like, no, we can't have the black people talk to each other because then we're racist. <laughs> um, and so it was kind of nice to actually see them kind of like kind of come together and clash a little bit. But like you know, th they they need to team up. That needs to happen because it's a sea of white women. Uh, and Ruth and Debbie are obviously in the main event. Um, Ruth is enthused. Debbie put upon. <laughs> Debbie needs to get her fucking house in order. <laughs> yeah, honestly, Debbie just like I don't know if just because she wears that American flag suit, I'm just like I'm just over her shit. A hundred percent. Like I think it's because, uh, so, well, no, it's not even that I'm non-monogamous, but I am like, girl, you have no other gigs. Do the thing. Yeah. Oh yeah, exactly. It's, and it's actually it's not that that it's not that I'm like non-monogamous. It's that capitalism has brainwashed me. <laughs> it's okay. It's all right. I'm so sorry. <laughs> so our next scene, we get Sam and Bash in their first official production meeting. Oh, and Bash is so excited. Um, <laughs> Sam uh, asks, says that he needs another video camera because his got stolen. Um, Bash is offended and says it's coming out of his salary. Uh, for for kind of context, Justine took the the camera. That yeah, was her big move. We call that dramatic irony. Yeah, we. As the audience now. Yes. I'm just trying to relate to you because I know you. Because <laughs> of author shit. 
Um, well, because I was going to say, because you have an English degree, I don't know if you actually I do. Uh, so it's okay. uh, three years of an English degree, largely a poetry concentration, and then finished my degree in uh, creative writing. Right, okay. So a- after I got sick of studying why words come in the order that they do, I decided to put them in the order that they do. That's very that's very dominant of you. <laughs> <laughs> um, you show those words who's boss. That's so, right. so Bash insists that this camera will come out of uh, Sam's salary because this is about trust and thrift. Um, so Sam addresses the, the addresses the girls um, and says that he wants his camera back. And he says, "No questions asked, except you'll be immediately fired uh, because there's too fucking many of you anyway." And my note here is like, "There are 13 girls. I wonder if this plays a part <laughs> later in the show." <laughs> I like that Bash is suddenly offended that he's supposed to be the rich guy because that was saying like you're this... just using me for my money. Yeah, like I'm here like, with money. <laughs> that was kind of you bought everyone on. Like you bought four, t- I guess fourteen people, fifteen I guess including Gregory into your cockamamie idea because you wanted to have a thing. Like he just wanted to have a show about women's wrestling. I don't fault him. I want that too, but it, I, I am like, what did you think your job was? <laughs> yeah. uh. Everybody wants to be a sugar mama or daddy, but nobody wants to actually put the lumps in. I know <laughs> it's it's dark and real. Um, so next scene, uh, I haven't figured out how to do sex yeah, in between yeah. scenes. Well, the, it, it, Things move around really quickly. It does yeah. work a lot smoother in the show, but like in the recapping, it's like, and then yeah. moving around a space and then cut to a new space. <laughs> so Cherry and Carmen uh, show Ruth and Debbie a sequence that they can use in their match. And Debbie unimpressed. <laughs> uh, she thinks it's boring and it's based on a sequence in another match. But Ruth tries to like cajole her with assertions that they can just spruce it up and improvise on it, and it'll be great. In the same exact tone your mother uses to convince you to wear a dress that will look terrible on you, but it's to please your grandmother. Like, it's like, oh, we can take the puffy sleeves off, and then we can add a bust. Like, it's just that kind of, like... That's like Ruth's just... entire persona. No. <laughs> it's just well, like, oh, Ru- it's okay. okay. Like, like, yeah, I know. She's like, it's fine. I'm going to fix it. I'm it's gonna fine. Fix it, I can do it all with the power of theater. Just love it's me like, again. Oh, my God. Like, it's a very, like, accurate depiction of a theater major who's trying 100%. to be an actress in their mid to late 20s, you know, just, like, just holding on to that optimism. And, you know what? It's like, I mean, oh, I didn't get that Disney show. So I have to come up with something else. Oh, yeah. Exactly. I'm a sp- I'm a spitfire. And you know, she was like the president of the theater club and all that. I mean, I think they say as much in the show. I don't remember exactly, but I'm pretty oh, sure yeah. it's implied that she was like a big overachiever, you know, in yeah. like the whole like uh, school and everything like that. And just like, I hung out with a lot of theater kids. I was, I was theater adjacent, you know, like I was not <laughs> in the theater. As somebody who was theater I, like, resident, I'm like, yeah. oh yes, you were the smart one. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like, and I just, Ruth is, like, a really well-done character, even though, like, she's insufferable, but yes. very real. Like, we all know that person. <laughs> well, and so I think her insufferability is kind of what adds to Debbie's humanity. Yeah, yeah. Because part of it is, I'm like, I am, like, I get it. She fucked your husband. You have to stare at her. It sucks. But also, she's, like, really, like, about it. Like, she's just so kickable. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I would think that like Debbie, if nothing else, would be brought over by just like Ruth is just pathetic, really, just I know, just an unfortunate soul, and like I, I just don't know how honestly Debbie has the heart to be mad at her because I'm just like she is just not doing well in life. Like <laughs> I, I say, yeah, I just mm. yeah, she's she yeah. is definitely Anne of Green Gables, like all grown up. Yeah, totally. Ruth is just like a real piece of work, a real piece of work. Like I. I find her quite annoying, but also I'm just like, you, you can't help but cheer for her a bit because she's just so clueless. <laughs> yeah. Like, you, you, she's the lead character. Yeah. You know, I appreciate a flawed protagonist. I do. <laughs> so later that night, we're in the hotel room and in and Ruth and Sheila's hotel room. Um, 
And Sheila is really good at Jeopardy. I'm proud of her. I'm glad. I auditioned to be on Jeopardy. What? You didn't know that. No, tell me everything. It's a multiple choice test. Oh. Uh, (laughs) Well, no, there's some parts that are multiple choice, but it's a, no, it's, you got to type in the answer. You get, so it's like, they'll, you take it online, you get like 15 seconds for each question to type in your answer. Okay. Um, And then if you, you get like a certain percentile, they call you back. Did you go to local in-person auditions? Oh, did you? How far did you make it? I haven't gone past the first stage. Okay, but um, to, so there's actually like whole blogs out there to teach you how to get good at Jeopardy because Jeopardy has a very specific format in terms of like the kinds of questions it ask they mm-hmm. ask and like how you play. I mean, like the game theory of it all. Yeah. Um, I mean that's how Arthur Chu got famous is that he knew the game theory of how to play Jeopardy. Yeah. Um, but so uh, Ruth is trying um, on a look. Uh, she's got her, she's got a red singlet and she's painting. She's got a hammer and sickle painted on her face and what <laughs> I assume is eyeliner or whatever. Yeah. Um, it ain't great. And uh, she's like, oh, maybe I need a new Shanka. And uh, I'm not a fan of status politics, but I do love uh, Soviet fashion. It, it is it, well, red is such a, an enticing color, but also I like that she went from I don't know what the metal thingy is, and I don't know what the dolls inside the other dolls is, to like I need a new Shanka. <laughs> like, I like it. We're putting effort in. She's Hermione Grangering this whole thing. I'm in it. Um, Sheila suggests that if they need fur, they could just hunt it because there's a feral cat colony down the street. No! <laughs> Debbie comes in and tells Ruth that if they follow with Cherry's moves, uh, they will look like amateur assholes. You know, and then Ruth's like, oh, you'll look great. You'll be great. So, like, I have to, I have to say that, like, Ruth's cloying desire to be liked Ugh. is like a sunburn. It's like, at first you don't realize how bad you got burned. But then, like six episodes later, it is unbearable on contact. Like it's 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 a little much. Yeah, yeah. I so I'm I'm and this is a challenge that I'm facing, and I think I'm probably going diving too deep with interpretation here. <laughs> Part of me has a very hard time figuring out what how Debbie treated her. Like, what is Debbie reacting to Ruth having an affair with her garbage husband? And what is Debbie reacting to Ruth (laughs) and like Ruth's personality? Because I kind of believe that Debbie would do this regardless of the affair. Like she's more withdrawn, of course, but Ruth is so like, she's like a sycophantic normal. Like I just, and, and part of me is like, I bet Debbie treated her like this the whole time. Yeah. And, and so that's some, and part of me is like, oh, well, this is, you know, adding further to, you know, against the Debbie stands. Sorry, Daniel, you're wonderful. And, lovely. <laughs> um, and honestly, I'm a Debbie stand too, because I'm like, well, she like fucking delivers. Um, but also, I'm like, I kind of get it. Ruth's unbearable. <laughs> like, she's just so hard to like witness. And you do want to, like, there's nothing, I don't want to coddle her. I don't want to hug her. I want to scream at her to just get her shit together and be a person so that we can carry on with this thing. I mean, like, Ruth is just, you're right, just hard to watch, you know, as the show goes on for sure. And, like, hard to empathize with and everything like that. Um, and, like, I feel bad for her only in the sense that I'm like, I wish you could just look in the mirror and see what you are. <laughs> And yeah. maybe, like, you know, the fact that she is just is so blind to how awful she is to just be around, like, and just, like, just, she's so desperate, and that's the thing, it's, like, she and Debbie clearly have this, like, high school relationship of, like, the yeah. theater nerd and the popular girl who, like, ultimately wants what the other one has, like, you know, Ruth wants to be liked as much as Debbie, and Debbie wants the drive and, like, the confidence in her uh, talent that Ruth has, you yeah. know, and so I think there's, like, to this like NB that's like always that's there like a classic sort of dynamic there but like uh they really just don't pull any punches so to speak when it comes well, and, to and, and the power is flexible and this is the challenge that all of us like grown-up theater nerds have to face is that at some point you're no longer the underdog and mark maron's in love with ruth 
we can all pretend otherwise. And he's the one pretending the most. Mm -hmm. But like the director is in love with you and he is going to guarantee your weird, crazy ass is going to be in this position because he like adores you. And he's probably going to cast you in that movie, even though he's banging Rhonda. Like you, you can't, like, this is a woman that's, like, lost everything. And in, in her mind, I, I think in Ruth's mind, she's like, well, Debbie threw it away. That's not fair. And they're, they're very much on, like, there's not that whole, like, hierarchy anymore. And so this is, like, my, my existential angst with all, like, nerddom, but specifically nerd men. Where it's, like, you have to know where you're, like, where you get to go and play, like, the victim because you are the victim. And then, like, know where you're powerful. And because Ruth doesn't own her power doesn't mean she doesn't have it. Yeah. I, I, I should say that I think part of why I find this kind of cloying is that, like, we've already abandoned the premise of the show. Yeah. Like, it was that, like, Ruth wasn't good at this. Ruth didn't understand this. Yeah. And that the story was going to be about how this, like, scrappy, overachiever... Weirdo. Like, weirdo, like, struggles to get by. But, like, we're already at a point where she's leading the class. Right, because Debbie is utterly worthless. Yeah, and and we see that later in the show where basically, like, Ruth has... Ruth is no... I mean, honestly, I think that by the end of the series, Ruth is no longer the protagonist. No. Um, But, so, Ruth says she's happy to do some extracurricular training with her so that they can, like, learn some other moves... Um, and when she's when she was like, oh, I'm I'm happy to like work on extra. I just thought of uh, her being choked uh, against the ropes like she was last. That that's my idea of extracurricular. Uh, Wink. Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> um. Uh, Debbie says that she's not really interested in having a friendship. I think that's actually establishing good boundaries. Like as normally you do read that as bitchiness, but I'm like, no, she's just like, okay. She heard about this whole heel like baby face relationship that, from wrestling before. It's just like, look, I guess we can do that. Let's do that. Like, I think that's fair. Yeah. And then it turns out uh, Debbie good at Jeopardy too. She's so good. <laughs> um, and then in Keith and Cherry's hotel room, <sighs> uh, Keith is showing off his new um, referee outfit. So in the beginning of the series, I was kind of met on Keith because, like, our first interaction was him basically pressuring his wife to take a job that was, like, too hard on her because he wanted the bathroom redone. But, like, their relationship is one of the purest parts of this show. I love how genuinely supportive he is. I love that he's, like, so gung-ho to be a part of this weird thing that she's doing. Like, he moves into a fucking, like, what is he doing all day? He is probably staring at his own toes. But he's doing that for her and for her career and cares about her. And also, like... I, I I resent that he has to exist to humanize Cherry, but he does a really good job of it. I also think that it's pretty great um, that in a show about women who like are uh, and women who are encouraged to develop like weird body issues. Yeah, that mm-hmm. like we have a positive male protagonist who's just like a chubby hairy dude. Yeah, he's a a, a chubby hairy man of color. And he's like wonderful and great, and they have sex, and it's not weird. And, yeah, and also you know, like the it's... fact that he's like chubby and hairy, he doesn't think it's like some kind of like, like gross like existential injustice. Like I think um, Sam kind of thinks. Sam does. You see Debbie kind of like do this whole thing with Mark where she's like, I'm going to call him fat because he exerts all this power over my life. And you have Cherry and Keith who are just like happy together. Yeah. And there's not a whole lot of, like, for all the heterosexuality that abounds in this show, <laughs> there's not a lot of happy heterosexuality. Yeah. It's fun like, fact. Not, not on TV of, in general, honestly. Yeah, exactly. Fun fact. A lot of heterosexuality is pretty unhappy. Mm-hmm. But, like, this is, like, nice. Like, they're just, like, good and kind to each other. And Keith is kind of, like, grounding to her where it's, like, here, let me support you in your time of, like, frustration. But also, I want to be part of this thing that you're doing. It's wonderful. Um, Cherry's a little upset that she's in a tag team match, which this show has like a particular, like, has a, has just like a particular stigma towards tag matches, which I, as a, as someone who prefers tag wrestling and who knows that in the eighties, tag wrestling is kind of a staple of the sport, but I also understand it comes from a very particular personal place for her. her. Well, yeah. Cherry's issue with it is special. 
Um, it's not that she, she she's basically been a, a stunt actress up until now in in Sam's films. She was doing black exploitation films, which stopped happening. Um, and you know she's she never gets to star in a role. Like I think she's just she's like I'm fucking owed this, and I would kind of agree. Well, she, she got clearly brought has on a, like her shit together by far the most of anyone anyone yeah. on the whole show. Like in and terms she of, like, has to, and she knows that. Like it's mm-hmm. it's not even like a thing that she elects to be. She's like, oh, I know, I, like I have to sign on to be the wrestling coach, even though I don't really know how to wrestle, because I know that the only way I'm going to be able to guarantee that I'm going to stay on this show mm-hmm. is if I do that. Because she gets handed a shitty ass character. Yeah, that's true. What is junk chain? That's it. Like, it just goes. It's just another example of like you know women of color getting handed half as much and having to do twice as much as yeah. like white people to make sure like whatever the thing is gets put together, you know. So yeah, it's just like what happened. What happens with Cherry? Like one of the only like functional people, and uh, you know she's put upon to do so much more than she should have to, and she should definitely get paid more, you know. But like that happens like. All over TV, all over <laughs> real life, you know, that's just like, it's it's very glue holding together this, like, so-called society. <laughs> also, context, like, Cherry is a house, presumably, with her husband, like, they're, she's like a, she's, you know, quote, an adult, with, like, an adult-ass life, and she's gonna go and, like, move in with the other kin, and with the med student, <laughs> and with the 19-year-old, can't-figure-out-blowjobs kid, and Ruth and Debbie and their big bag of bullshit, like, and then the biddies who are just like, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Like, I, I don't even know what their names are. I call them maybe Sandy and Blonde. Um, <laughs> and so I'm like, it's like she's she's below her pay grade in mm-hmm. some ways. Like, she's really kind of like doubling down for this because she's worked with Sam before and she, she needs the work. Mm-hmm. And... I think it's kind of important to kind of clarify that, that it's, you know, it, it makes me sad that that Cherry is not given a whole human perspective, but she is with Keith. So it's like, okay, like you get to see her as like a beautiful, wonderful person being cherished and loved and cherishing and loving somebody else. Keith tells her that uh, that she'll do great. She just needs to put in a little something, something, and that gets them to do this like dance together. And then they kind of wrestle on the bed and he pins her. And then he goes, you're out. And then Cherry has to wrestle explain to him that referees don't do that in wrestling. But uh, Mm -hmm. if I can put my glasses up for a second, um, (laughs) some referees will do the you're out gesture in the event of a submission or fight stoppage. Just (laughs) FYI. Yes, but does it normally happen in hotel rooms when one of them is in a bathroom? Um, I think Lux would uh, be in a better position to answer that than (laughs) me. Yes, Lux, would you like to talk about a little bit about your work? You know, a professional wrestling can look a lot of different ways. And, you know, like, it just kind of depends on the rules that a, your particular sort of promotion has put in place. <laughs> that much I'll say. And not to be coy, I'm actually really not coy at all. But <laughs> I think that applies to many things. <laughs> Carmen uh, takes Debbie and Ruth to her house. Because she's a fucking hero and yeah. is super generous. Um, to ask her brothers to train them. Um, and Carlito is eating an apple. Oh, my God. That is a, yeah. I see you shaking your head. Uh-huh. The audience is not going to pick that up. But that's a that's a little wrestle nerd thing that I appreciate. Uh, one of them is the one with the Mohawks eating Pringles, which yeah. I appreciate because I love Pringles. Are they vegan? Yeah. Uh, some, some of them are. are. The regular so, flavor, the, and barbecue the, the, flavor, and the bacon flavor are all vegan. None of the others are. So when I was living here for two weeks, uh, binge Lex, drink. I'm so glad you're here. <laughs> binge drinking on your couch. Um, there, I had a day where Zelda and I were just watching how it's made videos <laughs> as self care, and there's there there was the the Pringles one, which was quite hypnotic. This um, is so much better than when you tried to uh, raise her on anime. Okay, so. Part of why I might seem a little uh, flustered today, well, aside from the fact that this is, like, technically, I think, a date. Um, <laughs> oh, my God, you're right. How cute. <laughs> is, uh, the, 
This morning at nine, I got a text from Lauren saying that Zelda has escaped and that she wants me to come over and work from her house. Okay, I didn't say I wanted to. I said, if you can, I'd love you to do that. But yeah. if not, Zelda can fucking wait. I don't well, care. Well, I did not think Zelda could wait. And I was like, no, Zelda needs me. Lauren needs me. <laughs> so I walked. The, I probably should have led with that. So I, I walked the 30 minutes from my house to yours and I get here and she's fucking waiting I for me to is. let her I knew, in. It, I knew she would be. When I left this morning to go to Redwood City, which is the only reason that I asked you to do this is because I was going to be gone all fucking day and I was I was like oh is, you know Jetta has keys maybe she wants to like work in a quiet space maybe the, the the like apartment's enticing and I was like hey if you're doing a, if you're not doing anything or if you need a place to work you can go work at my place and oh by the way <laughs> <laughs> my my horrible garbage cat has run away, and when I shouted, Zelda, I'm leaving, she didn't come running back. I love you. You're really important to me. You're always there for me. I'm I'm glad that I'm 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 glad that you could be here in this like weird cucking situation. <laughs> Watching and let's just flirt uh, vicariously through you. Oh, baby. <laughs> thank you, and thank you for being in my life and for taking care of my goddamn cat, who's a piece of shit. Um, She's adorable. I love her. Like, if 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 you want to look at pictures of Zelda, they're on the Facebook page. But so like, <laughs> Zelda get, Jetta gets here, and like Zelda's waiting for her, and I'm like, I knew she would be, because you know, for this next six hours, she would have been panhandling outside my door, going, "Can you believe that my owner locked me out?" <laughs> and I was like. Uh, bitch, you live inside and you only get out because you escape. Anyway. I'm looking at the Facebook page and Zelda is, in fact, cute. I she can, is. I she's, can, she's, got a, she's got a Ron Swanson face. It's great, but also terrible. So, uh, Matt and Kurt. Uh, yes? Yeah, Matt and Kurt. Yes. Yeah. No, Tom. Fuck, it's. Can't it's, keep all these names straight. Yeah, it's. Tom. Do uh, the Lumberjacksons. Tom. Yeah, the, so the Lumberjacksons, Kurt and Tom, um, take them to their backyard ring, which coincidentally has the same Foley sound effects as the one they have in the gym. <laughs> um, and I know, they have this, like, the, the ring in their backyard is worth twice as much as their house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, so uh, I was watching, so on, on Tuesday, I, I brought our producer over for seduction. And, oh, that um, kind of producing... Yep. And uh, we watched Liberal Arts, which is one of my favorite movies to watch with hatred. It was written and directed and acted in by Ted Mosby, or oh. the guy that plays Ted Mosby. Oh, who boy. A, is a big ambassador of our favorite nonprofit, Fight the New Drug. Oh. <laughs> that old chestnut. Oh, God. So he's from Ohio. He went right. To, he went to Kenyon. And so he wrote... A, a movie, a bad, a terrible movie, and there, there are movies that you like, that you watch, and they're so bad they're good, and this one's so bad it's bad. Mm. Uh, but I feel that as somebody who generally, you know, you know, dates cis men, that I have to make them sit and stare at it, much like rubbing the puppy's nose in it. So, as someone who who consumes the porn of my we haven't decided what word we use for each other. Um, yeah. Squirrel no. friends? <laughs> what was that, Lex? Uh, I don't, yeah, I was trying to think of one, too. Just sort of, uh, you're like, I usually say, like, you know, my, like, uh, gentleman caller. So you can call me your gentleman caller. I was going to say squirrel friend. Squirrel friend? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so uh, as someone who consumes the porn of my gentleman caller, there you go. Um, I love this. It, I find that uh, uh, porn that, well, her porn is not a drug, and that I'm addicted to it. It's a it's in a drug that like I'm really into it, but I'm always like, am I doing it right? I just <laughs> uh, like you know when you get high. Well, I get high a lot. <laughs> I know that you don't get high so much, but like whenever I get like really high, I'm always like, am I performing well enough? Like, am I funny? Oh but, no! Like, do people think I'm hilarious? The I... ten times I've I've consumed marijuana because I'm s the goodest of girls. Uh, I've always been like, like, I'm like, am I acting normal? And apparently, it's like, yes, you're acting like a normal high person. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yes. I like, yeah, pornography addiction. I have a few things to say about that. As a registered psychology major and as a pornographer, that's just a crock of shit. Uh, like, I'm sure I'm uh, preaching to the choir here. But, yeah, just like, if we're going to classify, like, 
everything that gives you dopamine as an addictive substance, then like, like it's gonna just food is in big trouble. I know, food's in big trouble. TV's is in big trouble. Getting paid's in big trouble. Uh, like, <laughs> oh, uh, oh, suck capitalism. on that capitalism. Uh oh, hold, what could this be a threat to money? Oh, oh, like wouldn't want that. So just I'm just gonna put that out there, capitalists. That if like yeah. the this is a slippery slope to money being uh, a drug that we need to eradicate from the streets. So I, yeah. <laughs> Les données de la terre, debout les forçats de la faim. La raison donne en son cratère, c'est l'éruption de la faim. Ruth and Debbie kind of explain what they're looking for. They want to learn some like more impressive moves. Um, at one point, Debbie's like, I literally want them to shit their pants. I want to fly. And which is, well, fu- which is not, it's, it's like, not funny now because recently there was so a few like about a month ago or so there was an a, a problem an instance where a wrestling company vastly oversold the capacity of the venue that they rented and mm-hmm. then they ran out of water Ooh. and so people like like suffered heat stroke um and there was an instance where someone basically got so like heat stricken they shot themselves mm. in a tiny standing room only venue I'm, I, yeah I, I don't think that's what Betty Gilpin or Debbie was intending um, <laughs> but I think the, the her whole gi- deal is like you know I'm the big name actress I need to deliver yeah. which is like Debbie step Debbie steps up another episode of <laughs> Glow <laughs> um, so the brothers show off some moves that headbutt shoulder tackle drop kick which are great but they're like eh I'm like, that person just brought their feet up to that person's chest and yeah. nobody died. Also, that person was like 250 pounds and moved with the agility of like, you know, a tiny 80s gymnast. And yeah. like, they just don't even like blink an eye. And I'm like, that happened. Like, what? <laughs> that was a cool move. You should learn how to do a drop kick. <laughs> I know. It's like, worth yeah, it's worth noting that like so Carlito, who's Kurt, um is the smaller Fro, Fro or Mohawk. Fro. Okay. You know, he's the smaller one of the of the family. He's like the smallest wrestler in the family. At so, only six two. Right. And- but he's heavier than I like he's bigger than I am. Yeah. Like, it's, wrestling is very weird. It really distorts well, your perception of, like, bodies. Okay, so so I'm a, I'm a, I'm a blogger for my circus gym, and also I, like, is, is, so I spend a lot of time around circus performers going, uh, what's your deal? And <laughs> acrobatics is really difficult. Mm-hmm. Like, bringing your body up, especially how your body is proportioned, into the air. Like, one, being short-legged, long-torsoed is the key mm-hmm. um, advantage. But, like, for that person of that size, whether it be, like, what we consider fat or, like, muscle or just bulk, that's a lot to move around. Like, yeah. that person is a tiny missile. Yeah. At 6'2", they're, quote, tiny. Uh, and, like, for someone to be that, like, that spry and to be, like, that spry on the fly, because you know, again, that was, like, take six. Mm-hmm. Um... It's just like, as somebody who's like in the wellness industry, I'm like, God damn, like that's great. <laughs> um, and then during during the, the sparring, Kurt Jackson does a springboard corkscrew plancha. It's not technically a moonsault for reasons which I'm sure would bore you if I described. Probably. But, yeah. um, but Debbie very impressed. Debbie breathless. Uh, she says that's the thing she wants to do. Don't care how I want it now. <laughs> God, she's the fucking Veruca Salt of all things. <laughs> We're back at the gym, uh, and Cherry has approached Tammy with a plan to make some changes to the match against the biddies, um, which we are, uh, as of now, unaware of. Yeah. Um, Tammy seems a little worried that Sam would be upset, but... Um, but Cherry points out that the optics of a rapper and a welfare queen beating on two old women are pretty bad. Okay, time out. So, yes, I understand this, and this is definitely a move to manipulate Tammy. And I I, I, th- I like that 
Kia Stevens's character is consistent, where she's just she just cares about everybody. Yeah, I think that's really wonderful. Uh, it's it works against her, like it works against everybody that cares against other people because capitalism is a bitch. Mm -hmm. um, but no one is gonna care that you beat up on old white women. You want to know why old people don't add to the production line? Boo. Two, it's hard enough to get donations for Meals on Wheels. Like, people don't give a shit. Yeah. Like, it would so not be a big deal. But, you know, Cherry milks it, and kudos to her. And when Tammy asks if the sisters will play along with their scheme, Cherry points out that, that, they, that the sisters are making each other laugh by running face first into the wall. <laughs> That is sort of true. Which, according to the Glow documentary, is what the cast actually did. Like, they would just throw themselves into the wall as, like, a sign of toughness. I forgot that part of the documentary. Wow. Yeah. I, yeah, it's it's funny that, like, because this is such a... I mean, this is a show about, like, women, but it's, it's something that's, like, typically male-driven. You get these, like, male archetypes played by women. So, like... The two stupid stoner dumb friends mm -hmm. that just make each other laugh all the time. Like that's you, you get that in almost any other TV show, but like here it's gotta be done by by two straight, very femme, like very like, you know, normie I, women. I love it. Yeah. I mean cause because believe it or not, we have those bitches. They're great. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. <laughs> just dumb like just goofy, stonery, like white women running into walls, intentionally injuring themselves, and like being played as fools. They they have really good connections. They have really good booze, and they're generally very generous. <laughs> I cannot explain. We get a montage. We get a, we get the mother of all montages. Ah! We get a montage to Stan Bush's Dare, um, <laughs> which is originally from Transformers the movie soundtrack. I have a lot of complicated feelings about Transformers. Me too. As somebody who wrote a what I think uh, Transformers 4 is about piece, uh, in which I'm pretty sure it was about King Arthur. <laughs> no, that's, the, that's the newest movie. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, there's an entire like Arthurian like knights part of the trailer. Yeah. It makes no fucking sense. Yeah. Uh, Michael Bay could just eat my asshole. Well, it's actually like, no, he cannot. Yeah, no, no. no so don't like, give him that. no, like Transformers are like they're like the doc, like they're like Doctor Who. Mm -hmm. Like they're so vast and powerful, yeah. that you have to keep finding new ways in which they have fucked up our timeline. I know, like it's you know it's it's not an which yeah. and then Chuck Tingle rides in on a golden unicorn to correct. Um, so yeah, we get a montage of Debbie and Ruth learning to do. The plancha and initially they're very bad at it um but and and i like this the, and then there's this moment where like debbie is trying to do it and she's like it's like a trust fall except i have to look at you and remember all the reasons i don't trust you i mean okay you know she ain't currently fucking your man because you're literally falling on top of her thinking heavy plutonium thoughts like Part of me is like, okay, I get it. You have to remind us that, like, she cheated with your husband because we haven't seen him in a long time and nobody cares anymore. But, like, and, and, I, and I do get that she's kind of, like, got to be like, oh, this is a reason why not to like Ruth because she's the protagonist and we have to be remi reminded why people don't like protagonists. Because mm -hmm. we are built to like them, even if they're deplorable the way that Ruth is. I really feel but, like, though, that line was, like, a little... Cause I, it stuck out to me, too. I just think it was a little much. Like, they probably could have communicated that with, like, just, like, sort of a loaded stare or something, you know? Yeah. I think they've gotten the gist of that whole, that whole thing. Could have been like, oh, she doesn't trust her, but she has to trust her. What? Like, instead of it being this really How many reasons do you of, like, need? Yeah, it's just a kind of a, I don't know, that line. It's like, like really she stuck fucked out. your like, husband. That's the only reason. Yeah, I mean, like, yeah. the horse is dead. Put the stick down. So, exactly. um, but then each Jackson brother helps them each learn their half of the move. So, like, you know, Mohawk Jackson, you know, you know, does the bit where, like, you know, Debbie just jumps on him a bunch of times and he catches her to show her how to, how, you know, to get her comfortable with going horizontal midair. And, mm -hmm. and then Afro Jackson. Like, you know, Carlito, like, does the jumping on top of Ruth, you know, on top of a mattress. And, like, I, I that's really, I, I, this is probably my favorite part of the episode. Yeah, it's, it's, it's like, really wonderful. Just these, like, big buff dudes, like, showing, like, these women how to do, like, these moves. Um, 
I, I like that they cut between um, them. Pr uh, so it's the f the practice of the fundamental movement with the with the, the trainers with the, yeah. the lumberjacks and um, the the practice of the artistry. And, and it's very clearly indicated with their outfits. So, it, you know, and the first time they show up for the first like teach us how to be wrestlers uh, bit, they're all like pr like pretty and like very femmed up. And then they're and then they keep being femmed up when they're practicing kind of the the art of it, the acting of it. Yeah. But then they show up for the lumber Jackson's training with looking in jorts. Yeah. Uh, they look like Kevin Smith, to be totally honest. And I I like that where it's like okay, this is like the gritty fundamental like we're gonna build the foundation, and then it's like we're gonna build upon it with our with our like kind of beauty and majesty and like the art of it. Um, I like that that is sort of distinct with the outfits. Um. Yeah, uh, yeah. And, and you know, so the Lumberjacksons teach them other moves, like how to do a clothesline mm -hmm. and how to do like um, the shoulder tackle. I do want to mention that like th this is the point, I guess, in our relationship where we should talk about choreographed matches. Okay. So <laughs> there are some wrestlers who choreograph the whole match. Mm. So usually with wrestling, the way it works is like I I take it the ones that are anal retentive. Yeah, well, the ones that are really perfectionists, like I Macho Man Randy Savage was a really intense perfectionist. He used to actually have flashcards that he would use to quiz his opponents on their matches. Wow. I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna disclose furthermore, it's not just Joey Ryan's astrological sign. I believe if I remember correctly that Macho Man Randy Savage is a Virgo and that makes sense to me. <laughs> <laughs> you should really start a Twitter of like wrestler astrology because I I for one would appreciate the fuck out of that. All right, if everybody is down for wrestler astrology, please email you can call, the show. You can call it Joey Mercury in retrograde. <laughs> yeah, I, I I really like this montage one because the song is fucking badass. But also, like, I like how unafraid the brothers are to show women how to beat people up and to be beaten up by them. It's really interesting context because, of course, Carmen has been like not allowed to wrestle or anything. And um, and, and to me, like, part of it is that jumping into the arms of a dude and not having him wince is a baffling life experience as somebody who's like a larger human being. Right, right. You know, I'm 5'11", I've always sort of, you know, I've got this whole like, I, I weigh like plutonium, it's a whole thing. Like it's like, you know, I, I, I weigh more than the uh, uh, buck five that women are customarily supposed to be, <laughs> you know, when it comes to like types. And um, to have like a man repeatedly like catch a woman and like have that like thrown in his face and like have him not wince or falter or be surprised by her weight is is so beyond my scope of being a woman and so so beyond my scope of femininity. Yeah. Um which um it's in some ways I, I hate I hesitate to use the word triggering because it's not exactly triggers, but it's in some ways hard for me to watch because it's kind of like mortifying. Mm -hmm. Um but it's it's kind of like well when it comes to ideal femininity it's all you've ever wanted. So I will um, one of my very last experiences, like living as a man, mm -hmm. um, was I was in a production of Puccini's Turandot. <laughs> of course you were. Uh, um, where I was part of the chorus. I was, and specifically I was um, I was an executioner's assistant mm. um, slash soldier. Uh, and there is, um, I've already forgotten everyone's names, but like there's the, the prince is, the prince has like a, a servant, mm -hmm. um, and Turando, uh, kills her because she knows the name of the person. So, have you ever seen Turando or know what mm -hmm. it's? Yeah. So she knows the, the name, um, of, of, yeah, she knows the name of the prince and Turando tortures her to death to get it out of her. Um, and then I had to be the person you know, big strong man, right? That like had to carry her mm -hmm. uh, and, and show her off. Like, see, we've killed her. But she was actually bigger than me. Um, and I'm just like, I'm strong for a woman. I'm not strong for a man. I didn't do very well. And like, I, I injured her. Oh. Um, I didn't drop her, but like, I she was like having to like strain her neck to like be held up. To hold, hold herself up. Yeah, yeah. And, like, I get that. There was this like, like my inability to do this, like there was a lot of shaming that was involved there. Like a lot of like kind of ostracization from the cast for not being able to do this. And they just get, and like, they're like, well, fine, we'll just give it to you. 
the the person who is literally twice your height. Like there was this other guy named Caleb who's just like <laughs> fucking Caleb. literally seven feet tall, three hundred pounds. Like they just gave it to him after that, and that was like I was like, you know what? That's great. I've already proven that I fail as a man. I'm gonna live as myself. <laughs> So, one, I'm glad that that situation happened because it helped, you know, empower you to, to be the person that you are in a world that is very dangerous to you. But also, it's like, as somebody who's been on kind of both sides of that coin, weirdly, in an une unexpected way, it's like, there's like a mutual overall shaming where it's like, we shame men for not being able to, like, literally throw every single woman that they see over their, like, shoulder and carry them off into some sort of cave that they don't own. Like, I don't know. Uh, but also, you know, I, I tend to, as somebody who's a, a, a larger woman, I tend to date people that are my height or shorter. Um, none of my partners can, like, throw me around. Yeah. And and, and that, because, it, like, you know, I've been 5'11 since I was 12. It's a thing. Um, and so it's ultimately my size cannot be part of my femininity because yeah. it's like, it, it's not available to me. I was, yeah. I was not little and cute. It's interesting. You have two male partners who both have like pretty pronounced facial hair and I'm bigger than both of them. Mm -hmm. And that's like sort of interesting to me. So, some of it is it's like, I'm attracted to the men that are attracted to me. Yeah. And I'm, I tend to attract people that are my height or shorter. Yeah. It's and... cool you're 5'11", also, because I'm 6'1", so hello, fellow tall. Oh, really? <laughs> she's, she's taller than me. It's High actually really sees. great. High five yeah, sees. I, I mean, sees. like, if you're over 5'10", then I'm like, yep, you're tall. And then you see, like, 5'6", women show up and they're like it's so hard to be tall and i'm like who invited you i know yeah for real um <laughs> like, I, like no offense but no <laughs> full offense actually i'm like <laughs> come up to me and tell me that it's really hard for you to buy clothes okay like i have oh, to i know <laughs> oh god your struggle is so real excuse me i have to go drown myself <laughs> i haven't bought pants in years because i it's just it's I such a pain i can't own pants no i own one pair of pants um, and I saw, I've seen you in them once. Yeah, they're awful. Yeah. Well, I have one no. pair, they have like so many holes in them. They're like, they're virtually unwearable, except for that I'm really slutty. And so like, I make it work, but. <laughs> when I, when I, when I worked as a, when I was working, when I was working as a um, ear, earmuff slux, as a butcher, um, <laughs> I had to wear pants um, and I had to borrow those pants. Well, so for, for my most recent job, which uh, just ended, if you're looking for a content person, um, <laughs> I, you know, I had to, you know, I had to wear a shirt, of course, which, you know, it's customarily, they, they don't make dresses uh, with the screen print of whatever you need. They, they make shirts. So I was like, all right, I guess now is the time to go and buy pants. Here's what happened to the last pair of pants I owned. They were yellow cords, which my uh, one partner now has, which he's worn around his mother and she mocked him for. So there's that. <laughs> His mother is lovely, but also she's like, did you know he had bright yellow pants? So I'm like, yeah, I, I used to own them. <laughs> so uh, we're now in – Sam and Rhonda are in Sam's hotel room, and Rhonda's going through his his drawers looking for a bow tie or suspenders for her outfit. You remember that, like, that like time when I was, like, really into wearing suspenders with my skirts? You mean Tuesday? <laughs> I came to have a good time, oh. and I just feel so attacked right now. <laughs> I know, but that was, just, that was um, a classic dunk culture right there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Sam tells her that she'll look like that asshole from ACDC. Uh, which, Angus Young is great. I mean, to be, to be fair, if this takes place in 1987, Blow Up Your Video doesn't come out for another year. So, like, right now, yeah, the band's kind of out of favor. Okay. Yeah, all right. I mean, like, they're about, they're, well, because Bon Scott's died, they have to use Brian Johnson. Well, this is after Back in Black. Well, right. Yeah. So it's like, they've kind of, like, got to, like, really rebuild. Because it's like, as much as you can kind of, like, replace the lead singer, you still have to kind of prove your validity. Yeah. Rhonda knows that he's nervous about the match. She has to do a lot of emotional labor yeah. here. And part of me is like, well, like, uh, like, okay, she should, because she's, like, doesn't care about any of his art. But also part of me is like, God, he's a lot of work. <laughs> um, he says he doesn't want to talk about it, and she knows just what to do. She goes uh, into a back, into a, another room in the hotel room, I and know. gets a tape. Um, and it's a sexy home movie that she made for him. Well, it's a sexy home movie wherein she does a rap, and she does a rap about her character and about Glow. It's actually really amazing. Glow, glow, that 
that's the name. Women's wrestling is our game. If we play rough, please don't blame us. Our style is wild and you know you can't tame us. Are you rapping? Okay, so first we get to see Sam really cope with abandonment and how he copes with abandonment is that he does it with an oceanic depth of a pissy child. Um, <laughs> he is like just super, he, well, and, uh, as somebody who's like, at sometimes it's like when you're a strong female protagonist, you end up exhibiting like the worst forms of toxic masculinity. And so I have been Sam. And so, like, when he was like, no, I don't want to talk about it. Wait, where are you going? Like, I'm like, I, I had that last night. <laughs> like, I was that person literally last night. And I'm not happy about it. And I feel like I owe a lot of people a round of apology, um, which I'm formally writing letters. You know who you are. Um, but it, it, so on the one hand, it's like, oh, it's affirming because I'm like, oh, other people are flawed. And men who are considered in society more valuable are flawed. So I can be flawed too, maybe. Um, but also it's like, oh, like you get to see how he kind of handles any sort of like remote abandonment from somebody who mm -hmm. he doesn't value that much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Sam has like some serious like white male syndrome where he just like can't oh. resolve his like entitlement to success with his uh, failish late, his personal shortcomings shit, as like, like an artist and as a person in relationships, you know? So it's just like uh, he's got that like chip on his shoulder, despite having like all the advantages and all the opportunities, and he, he, he was able to make them work. And somehow it's the world's fault because yeah, he's been he told, he is yeah. lady shit. He he just I mean like he reminds me of that. my ex. I've thought a lot about this particular like <laughs> sort of personality. So there's a there's there's an issue that we have to kind of work out now. So in my notes, I wrote that she wears a white lab coat over her underwear. No, nope. you... <laughs> nope. I okay. call why... bullshit. Why is it okay? Why is it not underwear? Because that is not a bra. It can totally. It's a bandeau top if it exists singularly, or it's a bikini. It's definitely a bikini. In my opinion. Thank you. She's wearing a swimsuit constantly, and she talks about how she had to basically camp out by the beach and ask men for money. I think she's just constantly wearing a swimsuit. It's a I weird bullshit. frilly swimsuit. It's a That's weird and frilly swimsuit, but a swimsuit 100%. I agree. It's also yellow and she's very tan and she's British in real life. And that's not a thing as a, as somebody with, with English origin, we don't tan great. <laughs> um, we do other things like colonize. Okay. Um, <laughs> all right. So, uh, Sam is initially upset to find out that Rhonda found his camera in her locker and kept it from him so she can make this video yeah. and surprise him. But he eventually admits that the song she made is catchy. Yeah, I mean, like, I don't have a problem with the the song. I do admit that she was she like, what, why wouldn't you be like, oh hey, booyah, like when you were all like, I'm gonna fire people. Here's your camera, like, ugh. anyway. Um, so the next scene, Sam arrives at the gym, um, the night of the match to see Bash plugging a Casio keyboard into his sister's karaoke machine. Yeah. So we get our first hint that something is amiss in producer land. <laughs> um. Bash tells Sam that uh, he has to announce because they didn't get it because he's not announcing because he has to uh, hang out with Glenn. He has yeah he has to hang out with the clit joke. Yeah yeah okay. Uh, and he tells Sam that he'll do great because um, I'll be hanging out with clits. Yeah. So and then the next scene the wrestlers are in their locker room getting ready. Um, Ruth and Debbie come up with a safe word, which is totally forget. Um, <laughs> well, it's someone's last name. What? Schmucker? No, no, it's like some name that's on a... I didn't write it down, but it's like... It's it's a for... Like, the joke is that it's a foreign-sounding name that sounds offensive to them. Yeah. So, that's why they like it. Um, Could and, it be clit joke? <laughs> um, Sam comes in with, like, some faltering words of encouragement. I know. He, he doesn't believe in, in anything. And yeah. that's okay. Um, uh, we get a little... Uh, no real food uh, stuff in this episode. So, oh, but there is graffiti. There is bathroom graffiti of "fuck Nixon" on the urinal in yes. uh, the stall that Sheila is using. I really uh, like Sheila that part in... where she slams it open and she's like "fuck Nixon." And I'm like, yes, that's that's what I'm talking about. Yeah, a hundred percent quality content. Um, so uh, Sam and Rhonda, uh, which gone kind to of a... actually, if one now that I think about it, backdates the timing of the show. 
I think it just goes to show just how long it's been since this place has been cleaned. Yeah. Okay. Oh, maybe. That's <laughs> I, a good I would point. hope that it's meant to demonstrate that it isn't just like yeah, a total like, historical oh. oversight. <laughs> yeah, for yeah. sure. Um, while so Sam and Rhonda are in a corner and they have like a pre-match good luck kiss, Justin Justine runs over to tattle on Rhonda, saying that everyone saw her saw her steal Sam's camera. Uh, and then runs off. And uh, Sam asks Rhonda why Justine's trying to frame her. And Rhonda points out that, well, at least in her view, uh, she thinks that Justine just has an obvious crush on Sam. Yeah. And then Sam's like, what do I do about that? And then Rhonda goes, be kind and generous with her, as you are with everyone. And this is some good-ass <laughs> girl solidarity. Like, this is, like, Rhonda really came through in this episode. Like, she's fucking taking care of Sam and is also like, which is no fun. Like, I'm sorry. As this, somebody who is Sam, I'm like, like I wouldn't want to take care of me. My coworker has this crush on my boss who I'm fucking, and is trying to get me fired and dumped. And you know what? I'm not mad at her about it. Like I, I think that this is really and, and with some as someone with real stakes because before this she was homeless, sleeping in her car. Right. Like oh, that's right. Yeah, I mean, she right. was living she in her car, Rhonda. asking men for dollars so she could pay the parking meter or whatever, and it, it ended up, you know. <sighs> You're right. Rhonda is really the best character on the show. She has a view of <laughs> a view of Sam that um, I wish Sam had of himself, and then used as like a guidepost. Um, but his whole reaction is, "Why is she trying to frame you? Like, what am I supposed to do about it?" Like, his reaction is that she's supposed to be jealous, and she isn't. She's jealous of Ruth. She's not jealous of Justine. That's an interesting kind of distinction. Um, and uh, I think Kate Nash does a really good job of making her kind of like human and and kind of adorable. So now we're at our proper intermission to you. All and right, everybody, dump rum in your slushy <laughs> or whatever you're going to do and get your intermission uh, libations. <laughs> Dear Ashley, after 20 years of marriage, our love life has ground to a halt. Do you think a trip someplace romantic will help? Signed, Eager. Dear Eager, an exotic vacation would do your sex life a world of good. And make sure you send your husband someplace nice, too. <laughs> so, um, we're back from intermission. Um, so, on wrestling vocabulary, mm -hmm. today, uh, Lux, would you like to explain the concept of stiffness and, yes. and working stiff? I'm so glad you selected me. I am a bit of an expert on stiffness. Um, to see someone <laughs> in a wrestling match, specifically that is, is to... Um, you know, use a move where you're just, you take it too far, you know, either on purpose or by accident, but usually on purpose, mm -hmm. uh, much like, for example, sexy star at Triple Mania, stiffed Rosemary. <laughs> Yikes. Okay. All right. Yeah. Oh, so, so, so it's basically a way to describe someone as unfun. Yeah. I mean, and sometimes workers work stiff. As in a working stiff. Yeah, sometimes okay. they work stiff because they're new. Like, there's a famous match between Ken Shamrock and uh, Vader where, um, Ken, like, they put him up, they put Ken Shamrock, who is extremely stiff because he's new and just doesn't know, mm -hmm. up against Vader. And there's this, like, famous moment where, like, Vader screams at the top of his lungs at Ken Shamrock, like, ease up, ease up on me. Um, because, like, Ken Shamrock, like, basically, like, fucked his legs up so that, like, Vader couldn't walk for a few days because they were that swollen. And sometimes they work really stiff, like, in the case of, like, someone like, Fara like Farouk or Bradshaw, they work really stiff to haze people. I've heard about it. This is potatoing. Yeah, potatoing. Okay. Um, thank you for that, sweetheart. You're welcome. <laughs> I just love talking about stiff things. <laughs> is now the time to disclose uh, how you met Lux? <laughs> well, yeah. Um, so uh, I met because I was live tweeting Wrestle Kingdom. Okay. Um, and Lux, we just like found each other 
and then we sent each other like we're just sending each other like lewd wrestling porn gifts at each other sort of um, um i guess euphemistic or yeah you know, yeah window ish <laughs> i i sent mostly her... of oscar yeah I, I also sent you a daniel bryan valentine oh, i remember that <laughs> yeah a little a little uh daniel bryan valentine that just says yes 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 be my valentine i have compersion but it's really weird yeah oh my um god you should host a podcast and then <laughs> uh and then we and then, then what did we do and then we had like a few dates we watched wrestling together mm -hmm. um and then lux was out in the bay for a bit and we we had our first like in-person date i didn't know it was a date because i thought lux like was too cool for me and uh lux uh corrected me <laughs> jenna had to do this with our friendship too she was pretty convinced i was too cool for her i'm like fun fact no <laughs> yeah i think it's good to be direct but like you know i also struggled to move up to that so i, I mean just, i think that the reason that jenna realized that we weren't really like like i wasn't too cool for her is that she realized that my manicure is bullshit <laughs> And she was like, oh, okay. The whole thing. That, You're like a fallible wow. human. Wow. That. It's real talk. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So. Now it's, it's, it's trash. Everyone. Well, I mean, so is mine. I, um, yeah. One, one of the problems with the uh, marching against Nazis is, uh, you're bound to break a nail. Yeah. They chip your polish. <laughs> yeah. Amazing. Um, <laughs> but also, I will paint your nails if you punch Nazis. <laughs> Sweet. Just FYI. Just paint um, them with, like, lead-based nail polish. Oh, Extra, extra yes. heavy, you know? No, <laughs> so, I, I mean, I mean this whole Cassandra joke, so I, I have a, a, a lipstick uh, hashtag called Cassandra. Um, and my whole thing was when I went out. So, so I went out to San Francisco, which I knew was going to kind of be, like, mellow. Um, because I was recording a podcast during the Berkeley um, demonstrations this past weekend. Yes, past weekend. Yes. Yeah. Um, and I wore my, I wore what I call my waterbed of lipsticks, because it looks like a matte but behaves like a gloss, which is the opposite of how you want <laughs> lipstick to work. <laughs> it's awful. Anyway. Oh boy. So I was like, if any Nazis get in my face, I'm going to kiss them and just smear my goopy shit all over them. Oh, my God. Because um, that was my plan. And it, it is still my plan. And I recommend everybody. And I wore my rhinestone mask. Um, and it should it's all it's all's well that ends well. Um, but it, it's, you know, to me, that's like a fem, fem assertion of like p power over Nazis. And so if you are punching Nazis out there, if you were like at Berkeley or whatever, and you're like, you need a fucking like manicure come over to my house i will paint your fucking nails why we should i mean we've been friends a long time we should do the manny petty thing that is like a thing i'm no good at it but i'll do it no like, we should, i mean we should get people to do it for now that i say that out loud that sounds real that sounds what you're saying is i should dom them into doing things no i'm saying we should go and pay people <laughs> oh yeah yeah because that's like a thing 100%. i don't know We'll unpack my weird uh, class feelings. So wear that. your weird <laughs> lipstick, like saturate it in poison. If it's goopy, all's the better. And then just like lead tip your your French nails. Um, so Sam opens the show with a "Let's do this" in a very resigned tone. <laughs> um, so the first match is Vicky the Viking of Machu Picchu. Um, the audience is very unmoved by their introduction. Yeah, and everybody's like kind of it's not even golf clapping. It's like when you clap and then you hit your wrist. Oh god, I hate that. I know. Like oh, yeah. yeah. That's like biting your tongue like it's when you bite your tongue in mid conversation. Like you just like you just like can't if once that happens you're like when when you do that You're like, oh I'm not a person. You always, anymore. No, you always have to pretend quit. like you are just hugging yourself or like you can't like you can't be that person. You can't right. like you have to dive on a grenade so to speak first match is vicky the viking and machu picchu machu picchu comes out in a cape that terrible hat from earlier Ugh. and a fucking yellow sweater vest i can't even deal with this fresh shit <laughs> what is this she and it's not even like upon further inspection it's not a yellow sweater vest it is a yellow pale yellow sweatshirt 
with the arms cut off. <laughs> Brittany Young is a national treasure. Why are we dicking around with this? And why would you cut the sleeves off of a sweatshirt? Like, don't you get it? Or the, it's cold weather. I just... but And, like, wouldn't the torso be just as hot and stifling with or without sleeves because of the material? The sleeves aren't the problem. Yeah. No, I, actually, I cut off all the sleeves on my hoodies and sweat, sweatshirts. Um, oh, but you live in me. the Bay Area. I guess they live yeah, in LA, that's don't true. they? All right. As somebody who's recent recently been in uh, Philly, a place where it is customarily 87 degrees and 9,000% humidity. Um, that doesn't work. <laughs> like, See, I feel like when you do it here in the Bay, like, nobody... Like, so my biggest fear when I go jogging... I, I, I've taken up jogging recently. My biggest fear is that, like, people will look at me and be like, she doesn't know what she's doing. So cutting the sleeves off is my way of being like, I'm a pro. <laughs> da, 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 da. Um, so all of Sheila's goth friends are asleep in the audience. Yeah, they're so, super you know, useless. Okay, so a little peek behind the curtain. I wrote the first half of the recap. Uh, Lauren wrote the second half, so this is all in first person. <laughs> so you wrote, I'm not sure this will end in furry copulation. I tried to look up the different, like, words that we use for wolf sex, and there aren't many. <laughs> As soon as I went down six articles about alpha males, I was like, and we're done. Furry copulation. Um, Glenn clit joke, as you've called him. <laughs> yeah, no, that was what he was there for. I don't know what, like, it, Klitnik, I think it was his name was, yeah, or, yeah, yeah. or something. But I'm, like, but I'm like, oh, clearly you were put here as a clit joke. And it was like a, a spinoff of a dick joke. I mean, but that's what you are. <laughs> I should just name us Dick, like Dick Clit Joke. Yeah, like, yeah. So Glenn Kit Clit Joke is in the audience watching uh, the meager display. And Vicky the Viking's intro is that she rapes pillages, but mostly rapes. And I'm not sure how the hell I'm supposed to take that. Yeah, that was tone deaf, I think. Tone deaf moment. She'll, <laughs> do, she'll be great in Game of Thrones. Um, okay. Yeah. Um... <laughs> Uh, Sam asks uh, Sheila if Exodus is the only song she knows. Turns out it is. So yeah. I had that happen to me. Uh, I had that happen to me one day in college where um, we. So um, I, I've taken a lot of piano lessons and I can play pretty solid piano if I have sheet music in front of me. Mm -hmm. um, but like the songs that I can play without uh, are very limited because it's just not my primary instrument. Sure. So one day we are in multi-track digital recording, and we are in the studio to show, like, uh... <laughs> what? Sorry. I mean, as somebody who took uh, physics for poets... No, that is a stand-up comedy bit. Well, so it, Pat and Oswald calls it that. It's, it's not called that in current colleges. What it's called is Seven Ideas That Shook the Universe. But it's physics for poets. <laughs> Like, that is the same thing. And so I call it that because people have heard that comedy bit and know it. But it's called Seven Ideas That Shook the Universe. I have failed that class two and a half times. No, it's three times. <laughs> uh, but anyway, so... In my defense, the second time I sat behind a guy that was a chewer into a clear Gatorade bottle. Oh, no. How was I supposed to be a person That's like a in that situation? That's like a Title violation. Like. Uh, it was so ter It was like 300 people crammed into this tiny little, like, weird Occudome space. And then he's just, like, spitting in front of me. And I'm like, uh. ha. <laughs> and I'm like, if you're going to spit, look, I have uncles that do that, into a Pepsi can. Something that's opaque. But no, it was a Gatorade bottle. Um, Yuck. So we were all in the studio, and the, the, the exercise is that we would play the piano and then walk around the piano to kind of figure out where it sounds in different places. Because the oh, lesson okay. is about mic placement. Oh, okay. You do that with guitar, too. It's like, sure. you, you're like you know, you'll do a day where everyone plays the guitar, and you'll mic it in different places. And actually, when I did my final, uh, my final project for that year, um, 
I was able to mic it in such mic the guitar in several places in such a way that it sounded like different instruments, hmm. um, and that's why I got a good a good grade on it, uh, even though I was like extremely high and did it literally an hour before it was due. Uh, but so I went up and I realized I only the only song in that moment that I could play without sheet music was half of Heart and Soul, oh, and not even the good half. So I did that. <laughs> I did that for like a minute and then the professor was like, all right, get off. And then the next person came in and he played Jump by Van Halen on the piano. Yeah. Oh, okay. So you were like. So now you know why I am the way I am. Yeah, I do. So Machu Picchu comes out and promptly has a panic attack. Yeah. Um, Sheila is playing some sort of funeral dirge as the intro music that we've. <laughs> It's I'm, apparently I'm called Exodus. You, in. you should do your own. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So it's if, some sort of funeral dirges music, which Jetta apparently uh, uh, knows is Exodus. Um, Machu Picchu uh, runs away, and Bash goes out after her and begins tearing her a new asshole. But he needn't have bothered because she thinks she's having a heart attack. The new a asshole will have to be put in later. Um, and then Cameron passes out. It's, it's, it, she is unhappy. So the biddies are in white outfits and seem to be reassuring each other that this was a good move. Um, the brunette one, who I'm sure has a name, probably Sandy, is worried that they will be put on a watch list and worries that Bill Cosby will get mad at them. Huh. Psst, in 30 years, <laughs> that will be a point in your favor. <laughs> It's a whole back and forth about being recognized uh, by their shoes and blonde, whose name I don't know, recognizes, reassures maybe Sandy that this will all be fine. Um, she then says, look, it's not racist that the black girls came up with the idea, right? Whew. Oh, the white hand ringing. Um, I think we all know where this is headed. And then there's this bit. So it's sort of implied, don't worry, the black women are the real racists and we just are going along with their idea. And so then they put on their hoods. I I need I just I want to acknowledge now yeah. that I really hope that that the actress is so Cidel is it Sidel? 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 Sidel Sidel um Maybe Sandy? <laughs> if her name is Sandy, I'm gonna laugh and laugh and laugh. Um, which for Sh for Cherry? Or? Yes, it's well. It's her last name, Sidel Noel. Yes, Sidel Noel. Um, yeah. I I didn't know how to pronounce the last name. I didn't know if it was supposed to be, you know, Noel, Noel, blah 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 blah. Yeah. I really hope that she and Kia Stevens were informed about this at the beginning. A hundred percent. Because this is really like we're we're playing it for laughs, but this is really fucked up. Well, especially <laughs> okay. So let's let's give the writers of Glow the benefit of the doubt. I'm not sure they anticipated, one, a Trump presidency, and two, a Nazi march weekly um, in America. That's fair. Um, and, I mean, I think that, that was the big joke. And so, like, the, the thing that maybe Sandy says is, I'm trying to remember where I was when Martin Luther King was shot. Like, she's, like, she's trying to reconcile with it. And sure, it's, it's, it's white woman tears. And of the 80s... In a time where I think, like, Reaganomics had kind of, like, divorced people from, like, any kind of, like, like, so my, so my mother uh, grew up, uh, was teaching communications in the 80s. And so the, a book that's real that I didn't make up is uh, Why Do All the Black Kids Sit Together in the Lunchroom? Oh, no. Uh. Yeah. And that was a communication textbook. My mother uses that as an example of how the world is trash. Um, as yeah. it is. Um but that was a thing that people did. Like people were like, "Well, why are all the black kids?" Or like in the wake of the of the war on drugs, everybody was trying to solve the problem. Turns out the problem was white supremacy. <laughs> Spoiler alert. What? I That's know. Crazy. So baffling. <laughs> um, and so to actually kind of see two honestly blue collar workers in L.A that like give a shit an attempt is made it's not perfect but an attempt is made and i feel like that oh sorry it's okay that attempt is accurate sorry i just kicked 
Jetta or like skinned her toes. I'm so sorry. Okay. Um, and I, I'm not trying to give them credit beyond what they're due, which is that there are people acting in a show and it's all fine. They're 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 going to be fine. Um, and they and they reconcile themselves with the fact that they're wearing hoods, which is not great. Um, but it, 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 I think we were we were going for something specific here, and it was trying to empower Black women, and by giving them them this idea, mm-hmm, and mm-hmm, giving them this mm-hmm. this power over these you know what what is kind of a mediocre act. Yeah. Um. This 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 was important. I think, even if I don't like it, and I don't. Yeah. Okay. So Arthi and Jenny are rolling around on the floor, and Jenny is selling the shit out of all of this. She's like mega hot, like super into it. Um, I'm not going to say her name because it offends me and all humans ever. Um, the audience is bored because they're terrible, and Arthi is the winner of the match. Um, which yay Arthi, boo humanity. Um, and Sam does the intro for the biddies, the, their, their whole bit. There's something about waiting rooms and hell, and then they come out of it, and then in comes the clan! <laughs> Screaming about white power and segregation forever. That's actually their two bylines. They're like, white power, segregation forever. <laughs> um, those are the two that they stick to. Um, honestly, that's kind of probably the safest they could, they could go with it. <laughs> Um, as far as those things, uh, Keith is really uncomfortable, um, which is I'm sure, sure something they didn't factor in. And Sam is immediately apologizing, like, oh my God, what is what is happening? Then in comes Tammy and Cherry, people who are called Welfare Queen and Junk Chain, respectively. And it's pretty glorious. Um, Cherry is in some sort of mustard velvet... A uh, unitard, yeah, which is hideous, but she looks great in because she's gorgeous. And uh, Kia Stevens, Tammy, is in a like gold, like filigree um, leotard. It's beautiful. And Sam watches as people start to actually get kind of engaged in the whole deal. And the match is a disaster because the biddies can't do any of the choreography because they can't see anything. And people start screaming, and then (laughs) Sam says the following. Oh, this isn't as awful as I thought. Looks like the blacks have the upper hand. Helter Skelter, here we come. Kia Stevens throws and drops, maybe Sandy, uh, but it actually turns out to be blonde. (laughs) (laughs) Who then runs away and starts, and then they start ripping off the hoods and outfits to reveal granny panties and their faces. And it's, it's all off book and clearly like the white women are the most traumatized from this experience, which makes me feel a little bit better. Um, cause if anyone was going to be uncomfortable, it should have been them. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, that's the match. And it's, it's, it's the one that kind of awakes the audience. Even the goths are like mm-hmm. alive and care about shit. Yeah. I think it's like, you know, it's coming from like someplace kind of real, you know, cause mm-hmm. uh, Cherry and Tammy were both sort of like conspired to make that the plot line instead of them beating up, you know, the elderly. Um, and yeah. so that's, it's not just like something that Sam pulled out of his ass in two seconds, which is probably why everyone was bored, you know? Yeah. The first matches, they're like, whatever, this is just like crap. But it's the matches where, like, on the part of like the women, if there's some yeah. level of investment, then those are the ones that really like shine. And I think that's what this like first live show sort of reveals to everybody. It's like when they like, are invested in it in some way when it like reflects a real part of themselves like that's when it actually becomes like good and worth watching you know instead of just like wooden just weird thing that no one's really trying at mm-hmm. no I-, I totally agree the politics of the whole like hood thing aside which is like definitely horrifying not not a good choice um... on those white ladies parts but like uh you know i think like looking like beyond that it's like that's what i think they're trying kind of getting at is like you know it has to like reflect something real either about the performers or about the world you know i'm gonna take it at, 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 as its intentions and go the black women were saying if you were making it so that i have to beat up an old lady and be like a villain for it i'm like my name is junk chain and welfare queen fuck it i'm gonna beat up like KKK members, or I'm gonna beat up Nazis. Like, fuck you. 
like I'm gonna I'm gonna make this emulate white supremacy. And I'm sorry, Sam gets no credit for that, and he immediately takes credit. Mm-hmm. Oh, I know, right? Yeah, he's like, oh wait, that might work. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> Maybe kids do need to know about this. Like he's just like pulling. Oh, out. that that was one of the funniest lines. Like you're never too young to learn about our country's racial history. I'm like you're right, Sam. You're right. <laughs> you're right. Good. It would have been good if you'd come up it with that. I don't know from the beginning. Perhaps a little bit more tactful, but I mean, really, like. Yeah, or consulted like, with any of the women of color that you've employed. Yeah, but like ultimately, just like we can all enjoy seeing uh, white supremacists getting the shit kicked out of them and humiliated them, and to to know they wear granny panties. Yeah, yeah, (laughs) like you know that was like that's a little bit satisfying, I think. You know, so yeah, I think like uh, I think that's kind of what they're like getting at with that whole with the whole like live show plot line. In the parking lot, the EMT is telling Carmen that she had a panic attack and to try Weight Washers. I guess it's okay to make a fat joke if you're supposed to hate this guy for it. <laughs> um, Bash finds that comment out of line and assures her that he understands that she's an emotional wreck. Because who isn't? And Carmen laments that she wants she wanted her whole life to be a wrestler. And to do and to do this and that she doesn't even make it into the ring because she's got kind of like the stage fright. Um, Bash and Carmen both talk about how they are letting everyone down. The scene is sort of a snooze. Um, this is like the wrestling equivalent of Francis Ha. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Gas, please. <laughs> God damn it, Jenna. That was really funny. <laughs> I... All right. I did take my socks off before I slept in your bed while you were gone. Thanks, I think. That that's an actual that was an actual like that's an actual joke based on the movie, not just a rest yeah, not right. a reference. All right. Carmen gets to uh to make the fey gay man feel better. And in the middle of a panic attack, she has to do all this emotional emotional labor for some dude. Uh because she's the cash cow and because he's like a rich guy who's been cut off from, by his mom. Um, and his mother cut him off. Turns out he spent six hundred thousand dollars ish, which is uh, in in modern currency, almost two million dollars. Oh my god! See, I experienced the reverse of that at the end of each month because I work for a Canadian company. Oh, interesting. So <laughs> I get this like big fat paycheck, and then I have to like. <laughs> Trying to get that down to real money. Yeah, right. Uh, so we found out that he bought the gym because he couldn't figure out the pa- paperwork on renting. Cool. Um, she asks if the show is off, uh, which is, you know, I think a good question to ask. And he assures her that no, it's not. In the same voice that my former employer assured me that I would have a full time position. And then they did a hiring freeze. <laughs> real. Real talk. <laughs> So uh, we both have actually we both worked at a place together I know. where where someone revealed to us at one in the morning that they had run out of money. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Ugh, God. But it was wonderful working with you. Thank you. So Debbie and Ruth are in the locker room, and Ruth has to encourage Debbie that they will, that she'll do great. And Debbie nods because we're supposed to hate her for some reason. Like some of it is that I feel like Debbie is given this opportunity so is so self-absorbed that it makes even the self-absorption of Ruth relatable. And it's not, (laughs) it's not relatable. People chant USA, USA. Cause they're, they're engaged now. They're like super with it. Um, and she does this whole thing of that's rah, rah America. And that Jesus is American. Yeah. She says that her three, her three like favorite Americans are Ronald Reagan, Larry bird and Jesus Christ himself. Um, (laughs) And then she has a butt wiggle, which is kind of a weird crowd riser. Um, Because Kia Stevens is much better butt. Are you old enough to remember the Big Mac commercial with Larry Bird? I don't even know who Larry Bird is. He's a basketball player. Oh, okay. The Hick Hick from French Lick? Nope. I know who Larry Bird is. So not to so brag, my girl. But... <laughs> well, so so Lux, do you have a window of age which with which you can kind of disclose where you fall? Uh, I'm 26. 
Oh, okay. I think wow. I'm, yeah, that's right. Yeah. I'm <laughs> almost 29. Mm-hmm. I turn 32 next month. Yeah, mm-hmm. so I should know who that is, and I don't. Honestly, my mom is like obsessed with sports, every sport. Uh, oh, okay. So she had lots of Larry Bird shirts when I was growing up, so that's mainly how I know who he is. My my like, dad's oh, yeah. uh, <laughs> sport of choice is uh, a 1996 version of Civilization. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know anything. And oh, oh wait, wait, original Star Trek. Well, my mom is also a Trekkie because, like, I mean, like when she was in high school, she, like I, I had a back brace too, but she had like a super back brace, like with the whole neck thing and stuff. And she was a flag girl, so she was like a real piece of work, like a real wow high school. Wait, was yours due to scoliosis? Oh yeah. Bitch, high five. Oh my god, I <laughs> fellow tall. I, I knew that you, I could, I could sense a... your fucked up spine from here. <laughs> I know, I, you, you, you could sense my, my presence. Did you grow six inches a year, multiple years? Oh yeah, probably. Like, Were I, you I, just I like five, five starving five for like three years of puberty? Yeah, I honestly don't yeah. really remember, honestly, because I was just like wearing this back brace and just like hating life, you know? So like, <laughs> I was like 5'10 God. by the time I was 12 and I didn't grow anymore until randomly when I was 16. It was like, oh, how about just grow a few more inches? It's like, yeah. Okay, thanks. Just what I, I needed. remember being ravenous for like two, maybe three years because um, and like my body aching um, from growing so mm-hmm. much. Um, like you're sore, you're hormonal because spoiler alert, you have to become an adult. That's gross. Um, and then I was starving for like (laughs) three years. I, you could not, you could not give me enough calories. It was awful. Yeah. But uh, like growing up tall, growing up tall, it's being, being a tall person, especially I think like an early bloomer, it's like, (sighs) oh yeah. I mean, I was just always, I was tall out the loom. I was, when I was born, I was like 12 pounds, six ounces. Oh, really? Yeah. So it was I, I five pounds, six clothes. ounces, and then it was like, oh, you're going to be the tallest person in the class from second grade on. <laughs> okay, here's what's up. I was the second tallest person in my class in elementary and middle school, but I have kept tabs on those kids that had me beat, I'm, and I'm way taller than both of them now. The girl who was Good. me in Good. elementary school, she's five, six beat now. Beat them. Like, <laughs> you know? And the guy that was taller than me in middle school, not only is he only 5'9", but he has lost most of his hair. And so I'm like, huh, that's what she get. <laughs> and and you have kept most of your height and, and I assume your hair. I have only voluntarily lost half my hair. <laughs> oh right. Nice, even another cut. Undercuts. Yeah, I'm rocking the other Pretty nice. It's a secret. <laughs> but yeah. Um yep, tall life. <laughs> yeah. Hashtag tall life. Hashtag tall life, let me tell you, like a struggle <laughs> it is it, it really, really is. oh i have a quick actual like wrestling porn tall story i feel like now is probably a good time for this i recently yes. was i did ultimate surrender recently mm-hmm. which is very exciting and if you don't know what that is it's one of like king.com's um like studios it's, uh, it's run by ariel x and it's um a fully competitive uh wrestling thing and a shoot videos whatever um so like yeah the way it works is you do a uh, three rounds of wrestling and like the point system is basically like you have to be in control and then you have to like start like disrobing your opponent or like kissing them or like groping them or like fingering them and that kind of thing and you get points for that and so then uh at the end like um whoever has the most points gets to fuck the other with a strap on and that's round four mm. <laughs> awesome yeah it's pretty cool and yeah it's, I wonder uh, what that would be in baseball hmm? I wonder what that would be in baseball as somebody who's always who, who was was a, was, a, was a softball bisexual um, <laughs> you know how it is because all my partners have a type uh, <laughs> um, I'm like what, what would that be if I were trying to like manifest that into bases but also I fenced so I'm like would that be like you know like in the armpit or like where would that be as far as body shots i could definitely pornify any sport like if i just like have a second oh you and i should collaborate oh yeah i i I consulted with lux on her wrestling name yeah oh and that's the one i used evil marie that's my wrestling name it's that it's on the video the whole wonderful Mm -hmm. so i was recently on um i don't even own a television and and one of the writing letters was asking what our uh what our um wrestling names would be 
And as somebody who now has a wrestling podcast, I felt emboldened to answer. I had uh, Anne of Green Grapples. Oh, that's pretty. That's yeah. pretty good. That's what really I came good. up with, like on the spot. <laughs> oh wow! Like you've got you've got something there. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Oh yeah, but uh, I so I showed up to the shoot, and on the drive there, I was like, maybe I should have mentioned M six one. And so <laughs> I like show up, and the uh, girl I was wrestling, Annie Cruz, who thankfully is like a vet who's been like wrestling for twelve or fourteen years, and like one of her partners does like uh. Muay Thai and she was practicing with him he was like 200 pounds so thankfully she was kind of ready for me but I still like mm-hmm. walked in and she instantly was like oh I'm gonna lose I was just like <laughs> jokes on you because I'm secretly not athletic at all <laughs> oh nice but yeah I was just like watching our match and it was just me getting beat by this girl who looks like a lot smaller than me it's kind of hilarious like mm-hmm. just like imagine like just like Daniel Bryan taking on Big Show but just like, be, like running around his body like a squirrel does like a tree trunk and just taking them down. <laughs> so Ruth jackboots in with her intro music. I, I, I think you mean goose steps. Jackboot is the clothing. No, yeah, that's kind of what I meant. Yeah. Because it's not quite goose stepping. Um, but she's got like, she's like, look at my boots. Look at my boots. Glow the distance. You're number one. Uh, <laughs> fascist. Fasc- yeah. You're, no, you're number fascist, one. Fascist. Fashion informative. Yeah. You're <laughs> She's all like jack boots, boom. Because she's like basically like I'm gonna hold my like feet up, but I'm not gonna do the arm, but I'm gonna point at my feet. So she jack boots in with her music on her boombox because she came to class with a pencil, and it it's playing some sort of Russian opera. I actually couldn't figure out what it was. Um, which is as somebody who knows a little bit about opera, I'm like, what is that? What is that? And, but uh, she flips off the booing crowd. And Ruth threatens to fill people swimming pools with borscht and to neuter their pet dogs. I love this entrance. <laughs> like, this, yeah. Uh, the part where she's, it, like, marching and, like, flipping off the crowd while holding her boom box is, like, It's like the how first I time we see Ruth day. for who she is. Yeah. yeah. So the trouble with Zoya's hat is that it gave her this weird hat hair. <laughs> And uh, Debbie is an American flag leotard and made this whole point of saying, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wear red. Mm-hmm. And so Ruth has to not wear red. So she's wearing this gray sweater business. Um, and since Debbie isn't wearing red exclusively, she still made Ruth change. And that's like kind of an assy move. Mm-hmm. <laughs> anyway, the ref says no dirty business, no funny business. And then Ruth immediately kicks Debbie in the stomach. People are horrified. Sam calls Ruth a dirty, dirty girl because he's still mad at everything that he loves. <laughs> I'm sorry. He's in love with her. The fight is a little stiff, but still really engaging, which is good. Um, it, it shows that they're they're amateurs and they're nervous, but it, they still have the, the talent. Sheila is covering her face. Keith makes a yelling face, but says... Yeah, he gets like right up in Ruth's face and like... You know, yells at her with points, but it's, like, really You guys are doing great! Do you know what happens next? Because I don't! And it basically, sell, he's selling it, is, is his rage. <laughs> and 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 it's nice to see the back sort of side of that. Yeah. Like, oh. we, we do that a lot as wrestling fans. Like, whenever wrestlers are screaming at each other, like, we always try to, like, imagine the actual conversations that are right. having. Yeah. Uh, Mick Foley once said that he... Like he did that once where he got he got in Triple H's face for like uh you know the the yelling and then it, the whole time he was just telling him he loved his cologne. <laughs> I do, I no. Okay. I'm gonna bet that man smells like a sewer. <laughs> anyway, Ruth says da, and Debbie starts kicking Ruth's ass. The crowd is psyched. Uh, there's this whole leg choke thing and a head post move and Debbie clotheslines Ruth. <laughs> I'm glad you you I'm glad that you did all the recap for the actual wrestling. And then the goths are cheering USA. Because they're an American coven, damn it. God damn we're it. an American coven. <laughs> Ruth tells her Wait, hold on. You don't know who Larry Bird is, but you got my Grand Funk Railroad 100%, joke. 100%, 100% I got that joke. Because it was also covered by poison, which makes it even worse. What? Yeah. We're in a American band. That was covered by poison. Wow. Brett Michaels, the saddest of the sad. Um, 
Ruth tells her to do the move. But Debbie sees Mark's sad fucking face in the crowd, and Mark disapproving, and for some reason, Debbie care. Uh, and Debbie exits and leaves Ruth. Uh, so Mark is a lot of fucking nerve in the next scene, because he gets mad at Debbie for wrestling, for talking to Ruth, but not him, and then accuses her of making a ploy. He's just a wiggling pile of shit. Debbie yeah. says that he sounds crazy, and everyone on the planet nods like a dashboard dog. Um, Mark says that he says, uh, Mark then says, you can take the girl out of the trailer park, which is about the time that Debbie, a person who has been trained in wrestling, should have punched him in the throat. Uh, but no, he continues to bluster. Hang on, pet Zelda time. That's right, when I was writing this, there was a pet Zelda time. <laughs> uh, shout out to my pet Zelda, who's wonderful. Um... <laughs> Debbie says it wasn't a fucking trailer park, uh, which kind of like gives better like insight into the kind of the Omaha experience. And he laments that he was watching her out there and he didn't know who she was. And the answer is Liberty Bell, Mark. You struggle <laughs> with listening. <laughs> Debbie asks him how he found her. And, and instead of asking why he threw, didn't throw himself off a cliff, um, <laughs> turns out he followed her parents when they dropped uh, Randy off last week. And yes, Mark, tell us more of how the, all the solid ground that you're standing on. Um, then Mark whines that Gregory invited him to the live girl-on-girl -girl wrestling match. And she finally tells him to fuck you, which honestly should have happened before he had a chance to speak. She says that he always does this. He tears down any accomplishments that she has. And he hands her divorce papers and tells her to get a lawyer. Debbie is upset. I added the verb here because this is a rough scene. <laughs> and also her husband is a piece of shit. So Mark shit. You know, that is, you know, it, it, it hasn't ever been done. Um, so like, that's like a recurring theme here is like, you know, uh, in, in glow in some of these wrestling movies that we've been watching for the podcast, like you can tell like when people are like, they like wrestling, but aren't wrestling fans because they have actual original ideas. Yeah. This has never happened. This would actually be pretty good. Yeah. In in a wrestling match, if 100%. like you were outside and you're like your ex wife, like your wife gives you divorce papers and you get counted out. Yeah. Um, but it didn't happen this time. So it turns out Ruth has been doing crowd work this whole time, <laughs> and Rhonda finally does uh, her weird glow song just to give Ruth a break. I just want to say yeah. that I really related to Ruth in that moment because oh, really, God. I frequently encounter where you're just trying to improv through a scene and you're just run out of words and then just, just okay. You're like, Guess oh, I just got to keep, gotta keep coming. <laughs> yes. I don't know. New, new animal I can think of. Capitalist bovine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> wrestling is porn. Wrestle, wrestling is porn. That's what I got to totally say. Is. You know? <laughs> Uh, so she looks to Ruth to join in, uh, like Ruth has heard that song before. Uh, but everyone sort of picks it up quickly, and it's this really sweet ending of the episode. Clit Joke claps along and thinks that they have they have something, essentially, there. And, and Sam looks on proudly. Um, Carmen and Bash also look on, and this whole the whole team is a team. Except Debbie, who is crying in a bathroom stall right now. <laughs> Poor Debbie. And that's the end of the episode. <laughs> yeah, but um, so uh, how did we feel about the episode? I actually loved it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think this episode was like part of like sort of a, a turning point in the show where the the whole cast starts to kind of I think like you know they kind of signify it in the show too. Like more people in the cast from this point start to have more of a center role in the story which is nice yeah. you know because like at this point like they're just beating you over the head with ruth but then everyone kind of starts to come into their own and you learn more about other people in the show so it's a good episode good one yeah they get to perform for the first time where it's like all of a sudden the show seems real instead of this r removed weird thing that they like this weird sleepaway camp that they all became a part of yeah and tammy um, even gets a name you know yeah tammy gets a name and they they even get a gimmick which is pretty great. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> and I kind of want, like, Debbie to really, like, get over this Mark thing by virtue of getting over Mark. Yeah. Like, Mark is your traditional 
schlubby dude. Mm-hmm. As, as, as somebody who has a, a very like soft spot for schlubby dudes, because it's like, you know, I want everybody to love themselves and I, and I want to love people enough to love themselves, which is a terrible job. Don't do this job. But he's, he's a guy who got like, I guess kind of the quote highest caliber, most attractive woman that he can get. And then just tore her down to make himself feel better. Mm -hmm. Like, you're a bad person for that. I understand mm. that you don't feel powerful. You're a bad person. It's, and I I never feel sympathy for him. I feel at times sympathy for Ruth and uh, at times sympathy for Debbie. I am never a Mark Stan. I don't mm -hmm. think he's ever got a perspective. And, and largely some of that is because he's been cut out because I uh, want to guess most of the writers are women. Yeah. And have been fucked over by men. Yeah. But also like, He's a dime a dozen, yeah. uh, a, 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 a man of lesser power amongst men wielding an incredible amount of power against women is not a new thing. Yeah. And he's disappointing. So what did you learn this week, Lauren? I learned that stiff, uh, is sort of a working stiff. It's basically people that take it that, that potato, but almost unintentionally. Um, or like take everything just a little bit too seriously because they're trying to advance further. Mm -hmm. Um, it's, it's, it's not quite potatoing like unintentionally, but it's like, oh, I'm going to be serious. I'm going to be intentional and I'm going to like do really well. And then it's like, you cause incredible catastrophic harm to your, to your partner. And, uh, like play partners, you should not hurt your fellow wrestling people <clears throat> if you want to continue to work. Lux, uh, was this your first, is this your first wrestling podcast actually, that you've been on? This is my second wrestling podcast, actually. So, but, uh, the last one was I like, feel so cuckolded right now. I mean, I'm into <laughs> it. <laughs> of course you are. I mean, the last one was like, uh, a, a, like over a year ago, I think, okay. but uh, oh, it was, it was much more of a brief sort of thing. So. Were your first wrestling podcast since Trump? They're my longest wrestling podcast. That's for uh... sure. <laughs> All right, Jenna, what did you learn this week? Being on a podcast with your best friend and um, a lady that you're seeing. Um, gentleman caller. A gentleman caller. Yes. Uh, is uh, difficult when you're someone like me and deflects and uh, looks away and just tries to like play down uh, intimacy because uh, your best friend will inevitably want to keep playing that up because she likes and she she enjoys platonically seeing you be uncomfortable and your gentleman caller enjoys seeing you uncomfortable in a sexual way so i'm just like i think a podcast is perfect for that because neither one of us can really see you right now so it's perfect <laughs> and if we're talking about what we learned about being on a podcast from today's podcast i definitely learned i am not as smart or funny as i thought i was <laughs> that no you were untrue no you were great delightful. you were great you're a goddamn Thank delight. You, you are you great. You seem so comfortable and everything like that. And over here, like, oh god, like I forget how to make jokes. Wrestling. Remember, what? we're like 900 <laughs> episodes into this. Uh, that's yeah, a whole different pros, deal, you know. <laughs> All right, so let's go into our most Marin moment. Most Marin moment. Can you like explain um, this to me a bit? Yeah. So it's like, what is the moment in this show that like? Uh, Sam Sylvia is the most Mark Marin. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, I like that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so for me, it is him bitching that his girlfriend's sexy costume reminds him of a band he hates. <laughs> so whereas mine was immediately going, oh no, kids can't, le you know, can't see this going, oh, maybe kids can do this helter skelter, like taking credit for problematic shit that like his, his much better, far superior, like, employees have done um, and in riding the high. Like, that's typical mm -hmm. mediocre white man shit. Yeah. I definitely think mine is when the mediocre white man demands emotional labor from a woman who's recovering from a very severe panic attack. Yep. 100%. I'm yeah. sorry, Bash is Mark Maron most of the time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, certainly. Oof. So we can be found um, online at glowthedistance.xyz. Um, we're going to start having our own blog content up on there soon. Um, we also have a Twitter at glowthedistance. We have a Facebook at glowthedistance. Um, SoundCloud.com slash glowthedistance. 
We also have an Instagram, Echo the Distance. Where you can see photos of my cat, Zelda, and us. <laughs> and our various schemes to try and uh, get Melrose to be our best friend. Please, oh, please, I didn't know y'all have an Instagram. I'm going to have to follow that. You should. Yeah. Wow. Thanks for telling we me. We will follow that. you back. You're delightful. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you Lux, like do you want to plug? Where can people find you in your work? Oh, well, uh, my Twitter, Instagram, and Snapchat are all Lux Lives, but the E is a three. So you can also probably just like Google Lux Lives porn or something like that, and you will, you'll you'll find your way somehow. <laughs> All right, Jetta, where can you be found? I can be found on Twitter at J-E-T-T-A underscore R-A-E. And what are you working on right now? I'm, re- I'm working on a style guide for um, the Anti-Police Terror Project to help writers um, learn how to write about instances of police violence without reifying um, police-driven narratives of violence. The first rule is um, uh, a cab does not need periods. Um, unless you want to be stylistic about it. I love it. <laughs> I'm also, I have uh, my food blog, fryhavoc.com. Yes. Um, Pledge the Patreon. Yeah, I have a Patreon, patreon.com slash fryhavoc. Um, and uh, I have a, this week, uh, I just did a review of a cookbook from 1975. And I'm now, this week, going to do a, re- well, by the time this goes up, I will have uh, had a review of, um, 10 McDonald's commercials from 1984 and my thoughts on each of them. I love it. Awesome. Okay. You could, you could find me at Lauren Inc on Twitter. I N K. And you can find me on medium at dissident, which is a thing. Apparently if you clap my stuff, I get paid. It's super weird. Uh, or only some of it though, but you should clap the rest of it. I did this whole thing about, it turns out that like Silicon Valley is expanding and permeating and now it's called Silicon Prairie in the Midwest. It's super weird, but I have so many thoughts about that. Um, I also will do your tarot cards against humanity. Um, if you pledge my Patreon and, uh, my Patreon is patreon.com slash Lauren Parker. And you can find me on Facebook at Lauren Parker and I'm on Instagram at fuck yeah, Lauren Parker. I'm all over the place and follow Zelda on Instagram at daily Zelda because she's delightful and wonderful and has a Ron Swanson face. All right. I think that's everything. Yeah. Um, Lux, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Thank and you so much. Also Thanks being, for having me. And being in my life and also on various devices in various stages of undress and, um, and, and in various stages of madness. You have very interesting ideas for dates, so I'm, I'm into it. <laughs> Thank you for having me. This has been really fun. Yeah. I like you a lot. Oh, I like you too. Um, I have such conversions <laughs> right now. And I'm not even dating either one of you. And I'm like, just kiss. You're a really good third wheel. You're sturdy, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like the fulcrum. I'm not even a third yeah, wheel. Yeah, you're, you're, I mean, you're, 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 like you're the big wheel. You're keeping this whole machine Yeah, you're popping going. the wheelie <laughs> like, while we're up in the, up in the air. Um, you did it, Lauren. You really did glow the distance. Well, 